Hello and welcome to another episode of Grange TV. Thank you, Mr. Eli, as always. And we have a very special guest with us, Mr. Axel Whitehead. Um, we're going to speak about him as many, many accomplishments. Um, none, none which should be overshadowed by your entrance today on the motorbike. I just thought it was very... <laughs> he came in on a motorbike, super cool, like proper cool. Ugh. And then, yeah... And then, and then all the students were flocked oh, the, to you straight yeah, away. The students, yeah, yeah that's well, that, that was pretty cool, eh? Yeah, very cool interest. Still got it. Haven't been on TV for a while and still got it. So, so <laughs> do you want to tell us a little bit about your TV career? Because like you were on Home and Away, and yeah, yeah, I um, I suppose when my TV career started, I had no intention really of getting involved in um in TV or acting or anything like that. Um, I grew up. I started as a. I mean, I grew up on, on a sheep and cropping farm three hours west of Melbourne, down the Western District. And um, but when I left school, I was going to go jack rowing and go and work on cattle stations in far north Queensland and work on breaking horses and all that sort of stuff. And then ended up auditioning for a music school, v- uh, the VCA or the Victorian College of the Arts. And auditioned as a singer, as a jazz singer. And um, uh, and working on sort of improvisation, that's, that's a that's a sort of skill in itself. In the Improvisation jazz with music? Yeah, improvisation. So, so when... Um, that's why I love podcasts. You ask one question, then this conversation, you can just go miles on it. Oh, mate, sometimes they, they <laughs> yeah, go out there. Awesome. Uh, so improvisation. So you know when you know, you're listening to a tune and, and a guitarist is doing doing a solo or someone's doing a solo, that they're improvising and they're making that up on the spot. So when you see you know, whoever and they're just Like wailing. Santana and he's like, goes exactly, off. Exactly, exactly. So he is improvising. While the rest of the band keeps playing the song, so so when when someone play when a band is playing a song, you hear the song. They the whole band plays through the song, all the chords. And the lead singer sings the song, and um, and then when it's time to solo, the band keep on playing the music, all the chords in the song, and and that might be thirty two bars or whatever. And then the whose ever turn it is to solo, they solo over those chord changes when the band is playing all these chord changes there's a sort of mathematical equation on what notes you can play in what chords at you know at certain times of the bar so yeah there might be sort of five or ten or sixteen or however many chords through the tune the band keeps on playing all those chords dun, 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 and then whoever's soloing soloing is is improvising on top of those chords so what i did uh being starting jazz improvisation um part of jazz singing and it sort of started probably around the 40s, 50s is something called scatting, um, and it's not the turd scatting; it's it's improvisation, um, uh, and it's basically it's a singer's opportunity to to solo like a horn player, a singer, yeah, a singer. So when you hear like someone like Ella Fitzgerald going scootily bubba dooby and dabba doo dee and da 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 da, they're trying to emulate that. That's them playing their guitar or playing their horn or playing what else. But rather than playing something, they're using their their vocal, they're using their voice as their instrument, and so they're improvising it and you know making it up on the spot. So um, you know there might be like a beat, sort of like a groove like this, and then you can and so that's all sort of improvised. I mean, it's more of a rhythmic thing. But that's what sort of scat singing is. It's it's, and that's what you did. Yeah, that's what I studied at, at university. So to scat man, the scat man. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So so you you were going to be a jackaroo, and was, then exactly. Can you tell us your jackaroo career up until that point? Uh, growing up, uh, I'm the youngest of three boys. Um, the eldest now runs the farm who's six years older. The middle is an accountant, well, sort of more in finance and accounting and consultancy, and he lives in Geelong. He's the brains of the boys. And then me, the rogue, the youngest, um, me and my and my eldest brother, we probably had a lot in common growing up because we both had love for, you know, we, we both love going out and working and riding motorbikes and shooting and um, a lot of stock work and that sort of stuff. Um, and yeah, it just sort of made sense. Like I was about to leave school, didn't know what I was gonna do. Um, and always like, I mean, me and my old man, our relationship growing up was very much out on the farm, working together, learning about stock, learning about sheep work, animal husband, husbandry. Um, and then I did a lot of sort of horse work and, and we used to hunt and do events like dressage and show jumping and, and cross country and all this sort of stuff. And my mum was very much on the sort of horsey side. So it was doing stock Did work. you do dressage? Yeah, yeah, I did a bit of dressage back in the day, yeah. 
getting more interesting. <laughs> Go on. Uh, and so, yeah, so my jackaroo career up until then, yeah, it was just, I mean, I just love, I love working with stock. I love working with sheep. I love mustering. I love drenching. I love bloody marking them. Um, I love, you know, helping them when they're having trouble with birth. You know, you're, you're bloody knee deep, you know, elbow deep in a ewe and you're pulling out lambs and mothering them up and that sort of stuff. And I love that that aspect of farming that that husbandry that animal husbandry and just just learning on how to how to grow an animal and get it to perform and get it to eat the right grass and and manage your pastures and all that sort of stuff i I love it you know and and when i got into entertainment i thought if i can just make enough money doing music or tv or whatever to go and buy a block of land and start farming that's what i'll do and uh that hasn't happened just yet but uh maybe one day yeah at which point did you go? I'm gonna do jazz improvisation. Like, like was your was your family musical? Uh, my mum is creative and she's musical. She played a bit, but she she runs um, a music festival down in Port Ferry, the Spring Music Festival, which is uh, again sort of down the Western District of Victoria. Um, so she kind of got me into. I mean, it must have been the last term of school, and I started taking. Um, I'd played music all my life at school and I played cello and bloody drums and trumpet and piano and started singing and um, and then she said, why don't, you, why don't you look at doing this music thing seriously? So I got a couple of music lessons or singing lessons from a guy, I think his name was David O'Brien, great singer in Geelong, and he taught me about improvisation and, and, and using your voice as an instrument and that kind of thing. So I went into the VCA and I auditioned. Um, yeah, I got in. I was the only bloke singer that got in and... Um, and uh, it was kind of like, okay, well, we're doing this. And then the first year of that was awesome, and I, I worked really hard, and it was great. And then it started to get uh, – the course got really technical and very difficult. And a lot of the people there were um, sort of 25, 30, and I was fresh out of school, and I was more interested in drinking and taking drugs and chasing women and having a good time than studying this. And in hindsight, I was probably too young to go to such a sort of hardcore kind of, you know, I mean – prestigious or whatever you want to call it but a, 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 a very deep focused music school you wanted to be there five days a week practicing two or three hours bunch of lectures and that sort of stuff and that was good and, but I was, I was probably too young in hindsight then I ended up just leaving after a year and a half or two years and um, shacked up with a couple of older musos and they taught me more touring and playing on live on the bandstand than I did at school right, you know, right. some people learned great in school and some people learned doing the job and I'm one of those doing the job kind of guys no, it's interesting like I I um I was just talking yesterday to someone about this because I, when I first finished school, I wanted to do psych. When I first finished school, yeah, right. And um, I, there, there was the same sort of thing. I start, I kind of start. I think I enrolled or not enrolled or something. And uh, probably knowing me, I didn't actually enroll. Like I, I might have read the, the UAC guide, but um, I just knew that same same as with you. Like it was, I was like still too young to do that particular degree. Yeah. Right. Long story short, I did an, I did another degree and da 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 and did the coaching. And now I'm looking at doing like a post grade in psych and maybe branching off into that area because gotcha. there's certain I think there's maybe it's not for everyone. Maybe some people can, but I think there's certain degrees that are very like full on and you kind of like need some runs on the boards. I think to actually go and do that. That completely, career. completely. So is, is that similar? That's, exactly, exactly. I mean, a lot of these people that, that were studying, uh, or in my year, you know, some of them have been out and toured the world and played a lot of music themselves and, and you know, and knew, had that had that sort of that musical experience and had gone and, you know, exercised their demons and were ready to come back and, and take their musicianship to the next level, you know. Um, and... Um, and yeah, I, I was just too young. I mean, now I would love to go back and study. You know, now I'm thinking, shit, I want to learn that. You know, augmented something or other chord or something really sexy or technically. Like it's funny now when I'm when I'm writing music on the guitar, my musical knowledge and understanding of chords. Like I mean, I can play ten or twelve chords, but you know, there's thousands of them. You, you know, inversions and different things you can play. Now I wish I had of I wish I had that knowledge now. I mean, I can I can you know I'm practicing and learning and and you teach yourself as you go. But in hindsight, yeah, I'd love to know that knowledge now. So going back, exactly, going back and maybe studying again would... But I, but I think, because, you know, we are at TAFE here at the moment, Campbelltown TAFE, and, and we weren't joking, like, it was actually really cool to have Axel here and all the students, like... Big time, yeah. I'll tell you something. Oh, cool. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. This is the truth. Yeah. 
We've had that's probably the biggest response we've had to anyone, eh? Yeah, to Rob and they knew him, and there was other people lining up. Do you know what I mean? Who yeah. wanted to go get photos? Oh, really? That was by was far, like, yeah. by far the biggest response like anyone we've oh, had really? on the podcast. Even Mark Hunt when he came on. Yeah, yeah, heaps more than Mark. Really? Don't, I hope he doesn't beat the shit out of Mark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Said that, Man, Mark, right? I would have bloody flown Fab from Perth to go and get a look at Mark. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> Mark, Rob, like all of them, like by far you had the biggest, um, the biggest response, you know, to, oh, to thing. And I think it's um, it's interesting when you hear people because, and again, we've had like a whole bunch of other like really interesting characters here. And, Always when you look at it, you always think, oh, well, Axel was always on Home and Away and Axel was always da, da, da. And this guy went to that university and he killed it there and da, 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 da. And you don't hear the fact that, like, probably dropped out. You were like, now I want to go back. And that education is, look, lifelong thing. It's yeah. not like it just finishes. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I suppose in the, in the entertainment world, in the acting world, um, no one really teaches you about how to how to how to go about it and how to land gigs. I mean, depending if you're a musician or you're an actor or or, or a TV host or whatever, you know, um, say you're an actor, so you're auditioning for a lot of roles. Um, you're constantly going out there, and then finally you might land one, and that's great. And you know, when, when you're working, it's fantastic. You've got a job. Um, and you, you're making money, but but that doesn't like you know it doesn't last for as long as you think it will. And then when that finishes. Hopefully you go into a next job, or you can you can you know use that opportunity to build something else. And sometimes the phone doesn't call, you know. And I've been you know luckily enough in Australia, I've started my first gig in 2004, and then have sort of been in and out of work till now. But I've I've managed to kind of get a few gigs, whether it be a music gig or a TV hosting gig or an acting gig. Um, and no one sort of teaches you about how to sort of stage your career or save your money or. You know, when when you when you're working and you're in a gig and you're doing interviews and you're bloody getting free stuff and you're on the red carpet and all that sort of stuff, that's all wonderful. But that does not last. You know, you got to go. Okay, I understand. For this is what it is. I've got to save some money. I've got to capitalize on this this opportunity. I've got to make good contacts and make sure that I know what other projects are getting shot. So when I leave this project, I can go and audition for this, or I know that this is going on. And you've got to. Um, I think the the reason why you know I've I've managed to at least sort of you know, bloody keep a roof roof over my head is understand the importance when you do get an opportunity, capitalizing on that and, and making contacts and, and you know and, and 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 just knowing that knowing that, you know, it, it can all be taken away from you pretty quickly. I think I work with a lot of young athletes mm-hmm. and the stuff you're saying really resonates. One, when you're on top of the world, that's easy. Everyone's your friend. Yep. You're making money. And I'm not going to do, like, we'll just do it like this, so mat, make the maths easy. One of the things, like you say with people, is like, we're talking with Rob and with Mark Hunt as well here, and let's say you earn 200 grand a year mm-hmm. with with fighting or acting. It doesn't matter, the medium, it's the same. Like, whether yep. it's you're a musician, an actor, a fighter, whatever. So you earn 200 grand a year, and that, that would be like, okay, that's that's a decent living, oh. but you've got to, for argument's sake, let's, my maths is shit. Sorry. <laughs> let's say then you're really down to 100 grand a year <clears throat> yep. because taxes yep. and thing, or, but maybe a bit more, but let's do 100 yep. just to make it easy. Yep. Then you've got to pay your management <clears throat> and then you've got to pay, or you, you paid them at the start from yeah. the 200 grand, then the tax comes out, but yep. let, let's just keep it simple. Mm-hmm. You're down to about 100 grand. After you've paid for your, just your management and tax. Yep. That's fair mm-hmm. to say. Yeah. Yep, yep. And then um, people might look at that and go, well, that's still all right. After tax, 100 grand. Mm-hmm. And you go, cool, that's for that year. And then you haven't, but you haven't paid rent because you, Axel Whitehead still has to pay rent. Absolutely. Yeah. Earth. You haven't paid, you might get some free stuff if you're flying, but if you're not, like if you're not at the top at that moment, you're not getting free stuff. Completely. And Completely. So then, you got to pay rent, and let's say you're living in Sydney, so now you're down to seventy grand a year because mm-hmm. you're paying thirty grand a year in, in rent. Exactly. Um, you got to live. You haven't yep. you haven't bought groceries because you still got to buy groceries. Hundred percent. You know what I mean? <laughs> no one's got to buy you. So let's yep. say that's another thirty grand a year on groceries, and maybe you're eating out and whatnot. I'm yep. being pretty liberal here. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. So we're down to like forty grand a year. Mm-hmm. You know, give or take. You. De- that's kind of what you're earning. Yeah, a hundred percent. You know, that, yeah. that's kind of like the money that you have, and that's like when we sit down, like my accountant, our accountant, we've got like a good little team of guys, mm-hmm. and sit down and say that to Rob is like, for argument's sake, it's two hundred grand. That two hundred grand is actually 
when you're done, 100. It's 40 or 50 grand, and that is if you um, if you're earning 200 grand a year. Unfortunately, in those industries, you might have a year where you earn a million dollars. Yep. And then another year where, like, say, if you're an athlete, you get injured. Yep. And in Rob's game, you don't earn anything. Completely. And you may be doing really well, killing it, mm. and then you go two years, no... Not a thing. Exactly. Not a thing. Exactly. And then if you're living off that, <clears throat> you know, I said 40 grand, maybe that's drastic, maybe it's not, but I don't think so. Let's mm-hmm. say it's 60 grand a year. Mm-hmm. If your lifestyle is like 60 grand a year lifestyle and you know that it is, then you're okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But if you're living like you're earning 200 grand a year... Yeah, yep. yep. It's real hard. Completely. I've made that financial mistake before. I remember, I think I was on... What was I doing? I think it might have been home and away, and I thought, great, I've got a good wage. <clears throat> I know money's coming in, and I decided to buy a uh, a Corvette Stingray, a '77 Corvette Stingray, which is I don't know if you know if you're a car. Zero. Man. I know that it's a nice car. Yeah, it's it's a sort of like a Batmobile, massive kind of cock extension kind of thing. It's yeah, just yeah. a long bonnet, beautiful car. Um, I you know. Um, I, I'm, I make mistakes frequently and I sometimes I can't be told and I ask for people's advice who I respect and I turn around and do the complete opposite and fall flat on my face and I've done that time and time again. I Luckily, even, I've never done that. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Zero, never. <laughs> I mean, I, I even went to the bloody, went to the Corvette Club, got the head of the Corvette Club, paid him 500 bucks, said, can you come with me and check out this car? And he goes, mate... Uh, it's, it's just had a new engine in it. It's poorly done. This is going to go wrong. I wouldn't get it. I wouldn't get it. And it's, But it's got beautiful, it's bloody fresh paint. It's fucking loud. And it's got beautiful bloody white this and beautiful stereo and subwoofer. Oh, fuck it, I've got to have that car. So, <laughs> How old are you? Oh, shit. 20, no, 20, 20, 26. Oh, no, 28, 28, 30 or something. Yeah. Um, and ended up pouring so much money into that car and sold it for a fucking poofteenth of the bloody of the of the price you know and so point of the story is i've made some big financial errors and, and thought that like this is this is never gonna this is never gonna end i've got well i've got money coming in um i'm on top of the world once i go from this job the next the door next door is going to open and it doesn't you know and i've had another time when i was hosting a music show for channel 10 video hits and um i was three years in and i thought I'd do something funny at the bloody Arias one year and flash my knob and flash my nuts on stage and didn't get it and then got booted the next day and thought, okay, well, I, I don't and Go I was, back. Say, say what you just said then. Was that real? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Did you know about this? I, I think someone mentioned it down there. <laughs> tell me, tell <laughs> us about this. I didn't know. Uh, yeah, right. Oh, well, I was. Um, and I researched you and I did, that didn't come up. That didn't come up. Usually that comes up apparently on the first bloody search. Uh, I was. It was my first gig. I'd, I'd just done Australian Idol, that a mate kind of made me audition for, and I, and I owe actually owe my career to a friend of mine. Uh, when Australian Idol came to Australia, it was 2003, first year to come. It had been in the UK, massive hit. I'd just come back from China touring with a band, and um, my mate said, "Hey, there's this really successful show. He'd just been in the UK, and he goes, it's this Idol thing. I didn't realise it was a TV show, and he dragged me along to the bloody auditions, and it was three, you know, six o'clock at night. Uh, was sorry, this your it, first? Break? Yeah, break? my first kind of break. Um, How old? 23, I want right. to say. And we'd been out all night on the bloody grog and God knows what. Anyway, we arrive at the arrive at the, at the the line at six in the morning at, at Rod Laver Arena down in Melbourne. And we had to, and I didn't realise it was a TV show. I had no idea what was going on. And he goes, mate, just wait in this line and sing on this, sing for an audition here. And I was like, okay, well, so we waited eight hours and we'd get on the piss and blah, blah, blah. And uh, anyway, sung on the show. Got, you know, got a couple of, got sung on TV a couple of times and, and sort of got, you know, to the pointy end-ish of the competition. And they and then I uh, auditioned. I didn't I didn't sort of further in that competition, but they offered me, well, I, I auditioned for Video Hits, and which is a Saturday and Sunday morning music show. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. they had- To host it? To host it, yeah. They never had a host. So they wanted to kind of get a host and start interviewing and kind of take it to a, to a different platform. And anyway, I, I got the gig, and I remember when I was on Idol, um, uh, Andrew G, or one of the blokes at the time, said, uh, oh, Axel, can you throw to the next ad break? And I was like, okay. So, And there was auto cue and that sort of stuff, and I'm, I'm dyslexic, and I'm a really bad reader. I'd like reading out loud, I cannot stand. I'd rather sing in the nude. You know, I just fucking can't stand so it. So you're dyslexic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, um, I, I see, it's like TV static, but it's colored. So I look at you, and I'm seeing speckles everywhere. 
So you can't time. see me clearly? No, properly. I can see you clearly, but I can also see... I was going to tell you, like, I'm a really good looking dude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no doubt. Yeah. I don't, my head doesn't look like it catches me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, but everything's kind of speckled. I see sort of light and things around shapes and shadows and, yeah, I don't know. It's it's. And so you can't read? Oh, I can read, but but if I'm tired or I've or I've eaten a lot of shit food and I haven't exercised, uh, I'll look at. Some days I'll be fine. I can read and go boom, 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 boom. Be totally fine. Other days, the cat sat on. Hang on. The cat sat on the mat, and uh, it'll literally be. Sometimes it's that bad. Yeah, I'm and not dyslexic. Times, I read like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, I got. Um, uh, yeah, no, I got bloody put on those Ritalin pills and all that sort of shit as a kid. And was that good or bad? Or fucking had to... horrible, man. Made yeah. me really. I mean, it, it, it turned me from being and it, like I was always a naughty kid at school and doing stupid shit and rah, 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 and attention seeking and all the rest of it. And then I got on these. They put me on these pills and um, uh, they just turned me into a bloody zombie. Like uh, you, I wasn't making any noise in class, but you would just be uh, dun da dum dum da dum dum da dum, and it would calm me down. And then. Um, but then, then I started getting really bad depression. I had suicidal thoughts Fuck and that. it was real bad. And I was telling my brother about it. He was, man, fucking get off that shit. I don't care. If you get kicked out of school, whatever else, don't take those drugs. I so. always thought if I grew up now, for sure, mm. but back then, like, because we're the same age, I think. I'm 38 this year. Yeah, right. Yeah, so yeah. I, I always... Same. Th- yeah. Yeah, pe- people were, like, always, like, I think you're hyperactive because, like, I was, like, like still am, like, yep. like you know, like full of energy and I always think like they would have put me on some shit like had it been just like you know things that go on 1% either way like, 100% and I was just curious because I always saw it and like, people go it really calms him down and I'd be like it's not even the same person dude yeah that that and what was it like for you yeah well exactly it, it calmed me down to the point where it was um where it was, uh, yeah, I just turned into a bloody zombie. Yeah, you lobotomy know? would probably calm you down exactly, too. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and But again, I mean, it was funny though because I would sell these pills to friends of mine and then and they, they, would, yeah, they would rail them up. and They then, used to do the same. They would <laughs> down the skate park. Did you take it too? <laughs> yeah, I, they used to say I had ADHD because I would fiddle and tap everything. And, yeah. And start in the same thing, just full of energy and that. So, yeah, but down the skate park, the guys would... Yeah, it was yeah, different because if you don't have ADD and you take them, it works as speed. It yeah. works has the opposite effect. So I always had a little side business on the side. I'd take them and then give them to my mates, and they'd be fucking partying on them. I'd like the federal police to know that this is all hypothetical. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we got some more stories to get to, my friend. Don't worry about that. So um, you you that so they put you on Ritalin. That's yeah. how, how, when you were a kid. Yeah. Now you were. Hosting video hits. Oh yeah. So and yes. how did we go from hosting video hits to the? Uh, don't know. Let's. No, 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 no. I'm saying, how did we get from hosting video hits to? Oh, we're talking about finances, words. and we're talking about capitalizing on 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 moments. And I was telling how I fucked up financially when I was on home and away. Yeah. So like, how did we get to the taking oh, the clothes off on? Ah, oh, well, on stage. On air. That's, um, that's what I want to know. He's talking about using using. Yeah. So anyway, I was doing home and away uh, video hits for three years, and growing up in the country. As most country boys will know, or most men, when you've got a boot full of grog, you know, and you, and you you bloody had a few, um, everyone does a couple of cock tricks, or someone does a nudie run, and it's 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 normal, you know. And people, you know, some people think that's strange, but you are seventy percent of blokes. Yeah, country boys. Yeah, exactly. You're doing the roost watch, you're doing the little drummer boy, and you're fucking showing off and rah rah. Um, but and I, I just thought people. it'd be funny on stage just to bloody um, just to you know do a little cock trick, I don't know. And I had a few at the Arias. At the Arias, yeah. So I, I, I had to host a couple of awards with a guy. You were hosting Jabba. the Arias? Yeah, I was. I was well. I was hosting like three awards. Like they have a few hosts. They got the one main host, and then isn't five that on national TV? Yeah, but 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 they they have a five minute delay. So I I was on stage with Jabba at the time, and I just thought it'd be funny, and I was making reference to um. A photo actually I, I did a cock trick on Andrew G's shoulder in LA and Jabba got a photo of it it was a long story but um, anyway I just thought it'd be funny and uh, and I yeah, you know, I did it and then I got off stage and I called my brother I said hey check check out the fucking DVD I just got the old fella out and then got back to my table and then the executives of Channel 10 rolled up and they go what the fucking hell have you done and just went through me and I didn't think I mean it's a rock and roll show you know and what's a bit of skin you know and then and, oh, 
<laughs> and then actually, and then that night I ended up. I would have gave him a promotion. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Exactly. I'm only human, you know. And to anyone listening or watching, don't be afraid of getting the old fella out when you got a bootleg because it's a great gag. <laughs> and, and it will happen. And then, and then I, oh, so I got my got bloody taken over the, you know, got my ass chewed out that night by the executives, and and I didn't think I'd done done anything that bad. And I went out that night, actually, and I was hanging out with a couple of uh, this hip-hop, Aussie hip-hop group, um, and one of their, um, uh, I've never told this story, actually, in public. Please but, tell it. Um, <laughs> this is going to be good. <laughs> uh, a, a friend of mine, uh, well, th- uh, this, this dude's girlfriend uh, had some acid on it, had some LSD on it. So, and I'd taken a bunch of LSD at school, and that's another... Um, another bloody conversation and I sort of took a little bit much too much than I should have and uh, anyway I, we fucking you know the wheels fell off and I went ended up back at their back at their house it was the first time I'd seen USC I think we were watching K1 or we were watching Pride Fights or something I'd never seen any martial arts I remember I was kind of just going oh, on man. acid on acid and it fucking flipped me out man <laughs> it was so like, cool oh. And uh, and I went to went to uh, then then the next day we had off because it was a Sunday night and we had Monday off so I didn't think I had to go into the office and I thought everything was going to be good and I get a phone call like oh this is after the Aries yeah this is the Monday morning after the Aries and I get a call um, and I don't think I had any bloody sleep and I get a call from one of the producers going you need to you know radio stations are calling the papers are calling you need to get you know you need we need to speak to you really quickly because this is this is looking bad. And anyway, the, the, one of the heads of Channel 10 calls me up and he goes, mate, get into work now. We need to talk. And I said, oh, uh, uh, and I, yeah, I'm fucking cooked. And uh, bloody, and uh, and I said, yeah, I said, listen, I, I'm, I'm halfway to Wollongong. I'm with my family on a family reunion. I can't come in, rah, rah. He goes, I don't care where you are. You turn the car and you fucking come right back to work. So anyway, an hour or two later, I, I sit in there and he goes, right, actually, you know, you know what you've done. You know what you've done. Do you want to see the vision? Like, you know, what the fuck was going on? I'm sitting, I'm looking at him, and purple smoke is just fucking wafting out of his ears. I'm like, <laughs> and usually I know this guy really well. I know his kids, and I'm like, usually I could have come up with something or some sort of excuse. I'm just like, can we please have this conversation in 24 hours' time? I just need, I just need to fucking. So sit while tight. this executive is talking to you, yeah. you're still on the trip. Yeah. And, and, and the smoke is coming out of his ears. Purple smoke is coming out of his ears. And, uh, uh, and, I, and, and luckily, I said, I won't mention his name, but I, I just said, please, just give me 24 hours. He goes, mate, all of our sponsors are going to bloody pull out. You've, you know, you've, you've, you, you've done something really bad. And I said, I understand, I understand. Can you just give me 24 hours? And he goes, right, we're going to go to HR and we're going to, we're going to look at, make, you know, say, say that you resigned. And anyway, 24 hours later, I got the boot. Uh, so my point is, uh, the point that I'm trying to make is. Um, I, I, after those three that three years, I developed a bunch of great relationships with record companies, and you know, I, I had a pitch for my own TV show, and I had sponsors and rah 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 uh, for for a separate sort of project. And after that happened, uh, I tried to call people up for a bit of a reference. So, okay, cool, that's fine. <laughs> not one person picked up the phone, man. Not no, one no. person returned my call. So I've gone from the penthouse to the shit house in 24 hours. And uh, yeah, and then you're like, right, okay. So then you sort of got to pick yourself up. And I imagine how old were you? For 26, 25, 26. And I imagine like it's, um, I mean, back to back to that conversation we were having is when you're on top, it's great and you think you're getting paid, but then overnight, everything can be taken away from how, you. How, like I know you're saying overnight, <clears throat> literally how quick was it that everything left you? Uh, overnight. Literally. Overnight. Literally like overnight. And then I thought I'd let the dust settle for, for a week or two. And then, then I can start making phone calls and go, hey, can you give us a reference or I'm pitching this? And I, I had a lot of good relationships and not one person picked up the phone. I was like, right. Okay. That's how bad it was. That's how bad it was. And I didn't think, I mean, you ask any bloke in the public or anyone in the public. I mean, someone, someone's mother, like there was a 16-year-old girl in the audience and then some mother rang up the station and said, you know, he's sexual harassed my daughter because he's flopped his fella out. And right. It's like, oh, you, your fucking daughter's going to see a cock at some point. Right, come on. Come on. Yeah, I didn't kill anyone. It's a bit of entertainment, you know? It, entertainment. You yeah. yeah. And so what happened then? So then it was a blessing in disguise because then I got back to my music, you know? Like I never, never in my wildest dreams thought I'd host a TV show, never thought I'd be an actor. I, I remember watching watching TV as a kid and I remember watching uh, Brian Naylor on Channel 9 News down in Victoria going, I wonder how TV is made. You know, the, the, the way it was made fascinated me as a kid, but that was it. Never thought I'd get involved in it. Um, so, so yeah, anyway, got booted from Channel 10 and then, um, 
um, got back to music, started writing music, started practicing again, started playing. Um, well, I, I, I was sort of I had a band on the side, a jazz and sort of funk band that I'd played down in Melbourne with um, the, some of my mentors and a couple of other guys. Uh, but it was time to time to become a musician, you know. Like I'd, I'd sort of three year this career had just taken me this way, and it was time to get back to my music and um, and really go hard at it. So I started working with a few other songwriters and writing some songs myself. And then I met uh, a, a guy, um, actually the husband of the producer of video hit Simon Rachel Moore. Her husband Simon Moore. Um, was uh, big up in Sony Publishing at the time, and he put me in contact with a few different producers, and so, and I knew nothing. Like I'd come from this jazz and kind of world music and funk and improvised music, and then I found myself more in a sort of commercial kind of pop scene. And he put me in contact with a guy called Robert Conley, who's a fantastic writer, great producer. Um, an American fella who married Nozzy um, and grew up, you know working for a, a producer called Walter, can't remember, but it was Mariah Carey's um, uh, producer and songwriter. So he was making coffees while Mariah Carey was in the studio and you know all these big guys were coming through and you know Rob learnt from these guys. So he's, a, he's a amazing, amazing at what he does. He and I ended up writing a record together because we just clicked and hit it off. And so we punched out a record in a month and a half or two months. Um, and then, yeah, I released some music and the first single, I Don't Do Surprises, went number one on iTunes and all of a sudden, Two years later, bang, Axel's back, and the phone starts ringing, you know? And it's like, hey, hey, where you been, man? Right, right. It's like, yeah, you weren't fucking there when I needed you. But anyway, so yeah, so there was, it's, yeah, uh, that's how we got onto that <laughs> way around. How old were you when you started, like, on Home and Away in that? Uh, and and how? So I did music to that record, then started taking acting classes and auditioned for, I got a guesty on Home and Away for 15 episodes, and that would have been 28. Maybe 28-ish. Yeah. Well, who was your character? Uh, a guy called Liam Murphy, who was a musician, a rock, uh, a rock star. So you really star. stretched yourself. Really stretched myself. And then I've been in the States for five years, played another rock star there. So I've just been playing myself. But you were on The Shield too. What were you on The Shield? Yeah, I played a, a character called Hellfire, James. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, the Marvel character was called Hellfire, James. Um, oh, geez, I fucking forgot his last name. That's terrible. Um, yeah, so I did like six or ten episodes on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. on season three and four, I think it might have been. And I did that for sort of a year and a half over in America, playing it. And that was an Aussie, so I didn't have to do the accent. And um, so, so what was your character exactly? Uh, he was a guy who was sort of used to be a goodie and then turned baddie and then got given superpowers in exchange for something else. And my superpowers were... were um, I can touch anything and turn it into explosive or uh, and I also had a chain like a flaming chain so I shouldn't and working on it like a show like that when you're doing special effects and that sort of stuff and doing all the CGI stuff it's fascinating to learn like you know you might just pretend to have a chain and you need to make sure it's, it's sort of wrapped around the other character's neck because in post they're going to put the chain yeah. and that sort of stuff and growing up I used to love cracking stock whips and you know, and used to enter that sheep bench in a sheep show down in Hamilton. Used to enter the stock whip, stock whip, stock stock whip cracking competition. And funnily enough, like 25, 30 years later, this skill came in, and a bit of fly fishing sort of came in. But yeah, you, you have to you have to emulate where the chain's going to go, or if you're going to go around his legs, and you know, you kind of whip it, and you have to act that and sort of get that action correct, because then in post, uh, the blokes are coming in and putting that chain and whipping that round, and then waiting for it to rip round, then yanking it and then pulling and you know, you've got to mime or, or sort of act all these actions. Um, and yeah, but that, that doing Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. man was fascinating. It was incredible, you know, when you're, um, when you're on a, you know, in Home and Away, Home and Away is a brilliant show. Um, is that a strip? No, Neighbours is the longest running one, eh? Yeah, I think Neighbours started a year before Home and Away and then they did the Home and Away pilot in, oh, I want to say 82 or 84 or something. But Home and Away didn't come out to like, I think the proper didn't come out to like 87 or something. Cause was it? Yeah, right. The reason I remember this was because when I got to Australia, Neighbours was already playing. Was it? Right. And that was November of 85. And I, I remember it being relatively new. Right. And then I remember the first episode that came out mm -hmm. in of Home and Away and I was already living here. Is that right? Yeah. So I remember it coming out. Gotcha. Wow. Yeah. God, it's still around. Ray Ma's still there, man. Fuck. Who's that? Ray Ma, who plays Alf. He's still there. He's still there. He's he he is the yeah. I, there's a record. I don't know if he's uh, yeah. The 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 longest standing 
an actor with the longest role in in television history in Australia, and 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 probably as an Aussie actor to be paid, you know, to be working and and getting paid for thirty years running is unheard of. You know, like acting gigs, depending on the success of the show and the series, you know, they go for. <laughs> They might, you know, you might be working for a year or three years or five years on a show, and then you got to go and find your next job. How is he a good dude? Great guy, really good dude, really good dude. Have you seen yeah. the thing on? Have you seen the thing on YouTube? <laughs> I was, good, I was going to say he's pretty <laughs> famous. He's pretty <laughs> famous. Diner, don't fuck him in the diner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's pretty famous on <laughs> Facebook right. too. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there was a legal battle actually over that, and Ray wasn't impressed at all, which really? he should be. Yeah, I, I understand where he's coming from, but it is highly amusing. Fuck, <laughs> I just laugh and laugh and laugh at that. <laughs> Well, I think he's more famous, like like to, to today's people, like sort of thing. He'd be more like known from that, you know. <laughs> yeah, what I mean? like, yeah, yeah, yeah totally. far out. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. So, but he's a good dude. Really good dude. Yeah, really good guy. Um, and he's the sort of granddaddy of the show. I mean, the show. It's interesting. That show was sort of all about fam. I mean, you know, with a show like that, and a long-standing show, uh, the crew is you know some of the cameramen and people in wardrobe or or, or some of the grips. You know, they might have been there for twenty years, twenty-five years, and they've, they've been there for that long. Um, but uh, yeah, and and the show was all about sort of family values and about you know the, a nice little town where there's a few little relations and that sort of stuff. And then it started to get when I started, yeah. it was you know my character had a drug habit, and I started in rehab. And then they had these characters called the River Boys coming in. They were like a surf gang sort of. So it went from a sort of family show more to a more to a, a dramatic. You know, they tried to add a bit of drama and a bit more. You know, sort of higher stakes and that kind of thing. And Credit to the show, man. Like, I mean, there's not many shows in history that have run that long yeah. and they've got that formula down. And if you look at it, if you're a fan of the show, you'll see, you know, someone come in and they've got the bad boy and then the good girl and the bad girl. I mean, the storylines just kind of repeat. It's the same thing. Like, you could start watching it now. Exactly. The same. Exactly. But but a for, like a show like that, the format is that that you know it's on um, five days a week. At the start of each episode, they recap what's happened the last couple yeah. of episodes. And then you can come on, say it's at seven, between 7 and 7.30. It's designed um, so as a viewer, you can come in at any point and basically understand what's going on. Like if you miss Monday and Tuesday, you watch Wednesday yep. and you can kind of catch up on you know Monday and Tuesday. So a lot of the a lot of the dialogue is expositional. So it's like we are like, you know, I'd go, G'day Fab, how are you? You know, how's Tricks? Um, but in Home and Away Land, you might go, hey, how are you? It's great to be doing this podcast and having a coffee with you. So you're, you're actually sort of- yeah. With Elo from Ballina. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, 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 completely. So, Hey, on another topic, and this has just made me think about that when you're talking about Alpha and everything, and like, I don't know, you know, you've been in the game for a long time and this and that. Did you ever have anything to do with like that dude from Hey Dad and that? Like that with no, that whole fuckery? No, that's a good question, yeah. No, I am... Um, but did you Robert hear Hughes. rumblings of that shit in the background? Because like that was, that was pretty... Very full on, man. Yeah, yeah. that's, some that's scary a very shit. real thing. Yeah, no, I mean, as as a were bloke, there rumblings in the? Not so much, not so much. I mean, that was that was shot uh, out at. I think it was pretty sure it was shot out at Epping, where the old Channel Seven studios were. Um, I started when I started Home and Away. They were just moving. I think I did a year at Epping, and then they moved to uh, in at Redfern or Everly. That's where the studios are now. Uh, and Hey Dad, I think was shot out at Epping. Um, no, not so much. I mean. Um, uh, no, I, I haven't really sort of come up against or heard any kind of rumbling. Was his stories. reputation in the industry as like a like because like you know that's like we're talking like do, do you want you would know more about this than me? Do you want to shed some light onto what we're talking about in case mm. some people don't know? Well, Robert Hughes um, <clears throat> was the guy who played Hey Dad, and I think he. Uh, he got put up on sexual assault charges, I think a few times, and I think he moved to Vietnam or Thailand or left the country, and then over the years got chased down and got brought back and got charged, and I think he spent a bit of time. I think he is in jail, isn't he? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I'm not quite sure. I can't really remember. Um, what do they say? He's a guest of the Majesty, guest of the Queens, or whatever. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and, and, and yeah, I, I don't know a lot about that specific case, but I think he was, um, he might have touched uh, the young girl um, and maybe, and, and there was, there was, uh, yeah, it, it, some some really shitty behaviour, you know. Taking and she was like a teenager She was well. a teenager. Oh, yeah. younger than that, I think, yeah. you know, and, and I don't know the details. But I think it was pro prolonged. I was just curious because like, this is why, why I say this, because like that, we're talking about television mm. but then like when you think about it like in the in society at large this dude that's why i was curious like say for example 
you know, it might be happening in a house or in a classroom or whatever. Mm. But if this was happening in TV, and I was just curious, like, had you heard of anything like that happening? Mm. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Where I imagine it's a rather small industry, especially mm-hmm. in the Sydney thing, and you hadn't. Mm. So I don't know. It's just uh, yeah, interesting. Well, I think... Um, I, it just I, came to my head, that's all. Yeah, totally. Well, it, it's it's a small industry and, you know, you're if, if you're a douchebag people are going to know about it real quick, you know, and you can't afford to be a prick. Uh, I mean, you see sort of some people might, you know, green, green, you know, green actors, you know, might be their first gig and they get comfortable a year or two. They're kind of like, hey, you know, yep, yep, fucking yeah, yeah. And it's like, no, 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 bro, you've got to be humble. You've got to, you know, say, 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 a, say a, if you rock up to home and away, you might be there for a six hour day. The crew will be there for between 12 and 14 hours, and they're doing that five days a week. They're in a blacked out room. They're, there's either they're shooting on location, so they're up at Palm Beach or out, or there's another crew that works in the studio. Now, these blokes that work in the studio, they are doing 40, 50, 60 hour, 70 hour weeks, you know, really bloody long, long, you know, long days. So they've got their patients, you know, they're wonderful people, but they've got no time for douchey young actors to come in and act like a fuckwit and act like you own the joint or waste time or you're chatting off here while you should be hitting your marks or rehearsing or doing something you know it's it's you don't want to waste those guys time because it's it's a bloody privilege to be working for starters privilege to be working with you know to working with great directors who are who are teaching you new things and i mean I, i've kind of learned on the job i mean um so you you yeah, and, and, and these crew members, they know exactly what to do. They've been there for a really, really long time. And I think wasting their time or dragging down the production, which which some people can do, uh, that reputation will spread very quickly. And, you know, and, and you won't get work. And, you know, someone, a casting director or a director or a producer might go, hey, yeah, you were working with the old mate on that show. What was he like? And, oh, he was great. He rocked up on time. He was never late. He knew his lines. He hit his marks. He was good to work with. Or other blokes are like, nah, he's a fuckwit. He's late. He's arrogant. He's unrehearsed. You know, he's he's unprepared and that sort of stuff. So you, you can't afford. So answer your question. Do I know anything about that sort of stuff? No, no, I didn't. And that I think that happened kind of in the 80s and maybe 90s. I don't know. And back then it was probably easier to keep on the down low. Or, or I, yeah, I, I can't. But you had it. Long no. story short. No, no. You know, I was just. Yeah, no, totally, man. Cu- curious about that because that was um pretty crazy thing to because you grew up watching that shit. Oh no! And he'd be another dude, not I saying like that. Rolf Harris as well. It's like no, nah, really, you know. That, that, that's what I mean. Like if you grew yeah. up watching it, you grew up watching Hey Dad all the time. Like completely, like an Alf kind of character. Yeah, not, you know, like yeah. That, he's, that. he's 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 the father of Australian TV. You know, or Don Burke. You know, there it's, you like, go. it's like I grew up watching him, and you know, Mum's a massive gardener, and we'd sit around and watch you know Burke's backyard, and you're like, holy fuck, really. It's, it's, I mean, and like, like Kevin Spacey, one of my favorite actors, it's like, yeah. no, you're kidding me. You know, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's brutal. I was, I'm, all, I'm always curious about how, when you do a show like Home and Away, mm-hmm. do you use all, like, live on, on the set and or, or live close by? They put you up in accommodation near No, that'd and, be great if they did, man. Because that's <laughs> yeah. what I always thought, like, yeah. I don't know, like, no, no, every, every night do they. Do you know what I mean? Go out and have totally. a drink together and a few beers? Or well, how, or? how it works, there's there's two crews that are shooting at the same time. There's one crew that's doing all of the location stuff, uh, so a Palm Beach or the Caravan Park or wherever else. Yep. And then there's another crew that's doing all the studio work. So they're, they're doing all the internal stuff, so all the stuff inside the houses and rah, rah, rah. And so the actors, they all you know, live wherever you want to live. All right. And then you're traveling between, depending on what you're shooting and what scenes you're doing, you're traveling, you'll either be in studio or you'll be in location. So you're kind of traveling between both. And, and then, yeah, you're just kind of, you know, like, I mean, I had a love interest. Um, the character was Bianca, played by Lisa Gormley. And so I spent, you know, two years basically working mostly with her. So I wouldn't oh, yeah. work. My character didn't really, like work with Alf or anything a hell of a lot yep. um, so there's some actors that you'll spend a lot more time working with like any TV show depending yep. on yep. who, what characters are working with or what you know so yeah how what was it like to go from here to the US to trial to do all the stuff that you did uh, it was um, I was thinking about that this morning actually because I remember my acting agent um, went to America just when I'd finished Home and Away and, and set up a bunch of meetings for me with all the good uh, managers and all the good um, all the good agents, um, 
So I think she, she talked me up and said, you know, we're going to bring this Aussie guy over. So it, to, to get in these meetings, there, there's five top agents in America. Um, will, uh, oh shit, I haven't been there for a little while, bloody, and I've been working on music and my acting chops are, and knowledge are a little, little bloody slow. But um, uh, William Morris, um, uh, no, that was it WME, um, Gersh, UTA, um, Paradigm? No. Oh, I can't remember now. Um, anyway, I, I got meetings with all these big guys and then walked in there and you, you know, you're bloody suited up and hey, this, this and confident and I'd love to do this and rah, rah, rah and you know, you got to sort of sell yourself because Americans love confidence and if, yep. if you believe it, then they believe it, you know. <clears throat> and so I went, I had, took all these meetings and, and um, I remember I was lucky I got to choose between UTA, United Talent Agency and, and Gersh. And I remember getting home after, oh, and William Morris, I think. Um, or w, not William Morris, what am I saying? WMA. God, I can't even bloody remember. Um, and I remember getting home after having these meetings, and I've gone, I've just bullshitted all these people and said how great I was. I'm like, fuck, now I've got to bloody now you've got to get the skills to pay the bills, you know? Um, so uh, I, I went with UTA. And then moving over there, yeah, they, they you know, all the agents, they're like, Listen, we're just going to focus on film for you. You know, we're not going to bother with TV. We see you as a film star, yeah, you know, right, we'll, you know, and and we'll put you with Johnny Depp, and because we look after him, we've got the Coen Brothers over here, and we'll, we'll get projects. And you're like, holy fuck, are you fucking serious? Great, 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 great. And then you go out, and once once a pilot season starts, or when all the auditions start, you know, you're. Yeah, you know, you've got to have confidence, and, and part of the thing is walking in the room and going, "Great, I'm the man for the job." You know, absolutely, let's do this. And you do your scenes, and you kind of audition for them. Um, and it's 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 really bloody hard, and it, it's not all it's not all beer and skittles at all because you're. I mean, how it works is you get sent an audition, um, and you might do say pilot season. Pilot season is when they're when they're auditioning for the new TV shows, and. It, before a TV show goes to series, they shoot a pilot, which, yeah, is, yeah. which is the first one. Um, so pilot season is traditionally sort of through the end of January to kind of March, mid-March. And all the actors from around the world flock to Los Angeles because that's where 95% of the material is cast. So you get there and you might be doing one to 10 auditions a week. Oh, maybe not 10, say seven or eight. And each audition might be between two and sort of four scenes. So you might have between sort of eight and ten pages of dialogue to learn, and then you you know you might have one Monday, Tuesday, and then Friday, you know Thursday, Friday. So you've got sixteen between ten and sixteen scenes to learn, and you don't have to have it verbatim off you know off off book. What's you know so you can kind of have the lines here, and we can do the scene, and but you want to do it as best possible, but you can still look down. So you don't have to have the lines perfect, and then so you're going around. So it's and it's like a job interview. You know you're rocking up. And hopefully you are the look. Or hopefully you do a good job. And as an Aussie, your accent's good. And uh, and then hopefully you're the right person for the role, you know. But there's a lot of stuff that's out of your control. I mean, you you know they might be looking for six foot two blonde guy with brown eyes, and you know your ex. And there's so you just go in and do the best job you possibly can. And if you don't get the job, at least you've done a good job and you're in the casting director's mind. So when another project comes up, they might go, oh, remember that Aussie guy Axel came in? He's, he's you know, he might, they might have a fucking musician role to play and go, well, he's a musician, let's get him in. Um, so to answer your question, was it, was it hard? I, I thought, you know, when, when the agents, they tell you all this sort of stuff, that it's gonna be great and we're gonna make this happen, you're gonna be a star, rah, rah, rah. And then when you get there, um, and I, I <clears throat> when I got there, I got close to a bunch of really good roles. like you, after you after you do an audition, and there might be a hundred people going for that role, then you, you get a call back. If they like you, then they might get it down to sort of ten people, and then you do another audition where you meet, which which is called a producer session, where you meet the producers and the directors. And then if you get past that, then you do what's called the network test. And the network test is when you have to audition in front of the network or the movie studio, whoever else, and it might be you and two or three other guys. And you walk into a, you know, a smallish room and you've got all the suits there, you've got the people paying for it, you've got the writers, the directors, the producers, their wives, buddy, everyone, and you're in a small little room and the star of the show, and you've got to go and do the, you know, your best job. And you've negotiated your contract already before you go in. So you know that you're getting X amount and you think, okay, this is gonna be my big break. I'm gonna get it, I'm gonna get it. And then you go in there and you do the network test. What's the network test exactly? So so you, you, you've done three or four auditions. You're down to the final sort of two or three people. 
and you th- you know so and, and then like they've they've picked their two or three favorites and the network test you you have to audition in front of the TV network okay. so you've got all all the suits and all the all the big wigs and that sort of stuff and it's a horrible process but there's no other better way to audition for something like that and yeah you got you got to audition in front of all these big guys so it's bloody nerve-wracking and and then you get a phone call going they loved you they loved you but but and that happens time and time again so uh, bloody short you know short answer um it, it's it's bloody tough because you think this is going to be the one and then it doesn't happen and that happens time and time and time like i've been there for five years i've probably done 150 auditions got you know maybe got really close to about 10 jobs and booked probably three you know so so you can sort of work out the numbers you know um and it's not it's 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 bloody hard it's like going for a job interview every day and going we love you but no you go okay cool and after sort of a while it does take its toll on it you know your confidence can get rocked and you're missing home and you're out of money and like, I mean, I went back and I ran out of money for a while, went and worked at a bloody bar for 10 bucks an hour and tips. When, when was this? Ah, oh, shit, 200, uh, what are we now, 2000, what are we, 18? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, 15, 16, 2016, maybe, or 15. And yeah, just ran out of money, had no work and went, right, what do I gotta do? So I was, um, at one point I was painting Chris Hemsworth house, Chris Hemsworth's house actually and i used to work with him well i i he left home and away and i just went on to home and away so we didn't cross paths and um i knew a mate who did a bit of handiwork and um at one point i remember and i remember he just bought this massive house in malibu it was paul hogan's house and i'm sitting there painting his house going that motherfucker i'm painting his house (laughs) (laughs) and it was awesome it was cool um, but uh, yeah, no, and uh, yeah, I went and worked at a bar. I mean, I hadn't worked at a bar since I was bloody 18, 19 or done sort of any hospitality work and going from, you know, when I was 19, I was getting 16 bucks. And now when I'm 30 at the time, you know, 33 or whatever, 34, you're working for 10 bucks and tips. And it's, it's a very humbling experience, you know, when you're going back and either digging ditches or bloody pouring beers or doing what you can. There, there is, a, I think, something there that makes you understand like how that you're not infallible though, you know what I mean? Like I think, Completely. Um, Rob was talking about this when, um, he, he see, he won the Smashes, which is like a reality show for fighters. Yeah, 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 should you? Yeah, yeah the Ultimate Fighter. Yeah, 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 so he won the Ultimate Fighter and he was living in Cronulla at the time, like in the Shire, mm-hmm. and he kind of grew up around there as well. And so he was very, like, you know, everyone knew him, da 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 and then he was, long story, because I don't want to put anyone out there necessarily, yep. but he went from, that and then we were we were already kind of working together but not a lot like mm-hmm. i'd see him once a week or something or whatever and he was always like a nice guy but he was kind of on top of the world you know he'd won a couple of fights in ufc not not bad but not any more than what any of us would be if you're 21 years old sure completely. and you can bash everyone in yeah, the country you know what I mean? completely. and another one yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um and like so people knew him and that's so it, it's without like there would be a sense of confidence to it yeah you know, let's put it that way uh-huh, uh-huh and um which anyone that's has had any level of success when they're too young was probably yeah you know um, i have not had that opportunity so <laughs> <laughs> that's probably why I stayed humble. But, but um, yeah, and he went from that. Then he lost two fights in a row against some really good guys. That's right. Which ironically, when I saw it, was um, probably one of the fights, the two fights at, at at the time that impressed me the most about him. Is that right? Yeah, just like um, Court McGee at the time was like a real rugged, rugged veteran and you had to get up early to beat him. Gotcha. And Rob went three rounds, lost a split decision with him. Did he really? Right. Yeah. That fight. They just yeah. Ba- beat the shit out of each other. Yeah, and, wow. And um, <clears throat> he's a young guy coming up, like exactly like you were saying, like a, like when you went to do that course and you were a young guy and then there's these other older guys that yeah. that had just been through it. <coughs> Paul me. McGee knew what he had to do to put his level, his chances of winning higher. Gotcha. And it was just a really good fight and they, they, they just bashed each other. Um, he lost that fight and then he lost the fight against Stephen Thompson. Stephen Thompson stopped him in the yeah, first round. Yeah, I saw that, yeah. But it was a good fight, like the way, again, young guy, Stephen Thompson at the time was kind of like an older version of what Rob completely kind of thing was going to be. Yeah. So it was an interesting fight as well and I looked at both those fights and I thought that was really cool. Yeah. But he went from being Mr. Popular to nobody returning his calls completely you know and, and how did he handle that uh, you know 
I, I, to be honest with you, I'd like to sit here and go, you know, nothing with water off a duck's Oh, back. no, 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 it's brutal. It's brutal, yeah. but, but it's what you make of yourself. Well, clearly, you made, him, you know, made something of yourself, but, but it's how you use that opportunity. Or, I, I think, um, <clears> you know, like, he, he probably learnt a lot of stuff like that um, you don't have to, like the answer's within you. It probably sounds cliche, but the answer is within you. Like, you can sit there and go, the coach did this or da-da-da, or I have to go and train over there, or I have to, yeah, but yep. the end result is like, if you have to get through eight additions a week and you're only doing two mm. and you can go, you can sit there and go, oh, it's because um, they had better connections than me and I didn't. And I think, well, okay, cool. Maybe, maybe that's the case, but you're only doing eight auditions. You, you're meant to be doing eight. You're only doing two. Yep. How about we aim for 10? Yeah. You know what I mean? Completely. Completely. And um, then maybe your networks will broaden as well. Yep. So I don't see that there's a massive difference. Mm. And I think... Uh, he had to really one of the Rob's best I think Rob's best uh, abilities is like and not a lot of people have this not, there's nothing to do even with his fighting it's like you can sort of hold a mirror up to him and go this is how you're acting mate you know this is what you're doing mm-hmm. and um, I'm sure it's not all sunshine and rainbows for him in that moment mm-hmm. but he can go back and go yeah it was and, and change that. Gotcha. Whereas a lot of people be like, no, it's Eli's fault because you know completely. I had a cold that day, and that's why he outboxed me. You completely, know I mean? completely. And that's really interesting. Yeah, and, and, and I mean, as a uh, um, as a massive UFC fan, when you do see a fighter go, you know what? He's the better man today. He's the better man. I did X X X. I didn't see that. I had a little fault in my game. It's no one else's. You know, it wasn't my coach. It wasn't this. I take full responsibility for it and I'm going to go and workshop and I'll be back even stronger. And you see those blokes do that and come back and it's just so inspiring, you know. And and it's it's a, and you can smell bullshit. You know, it was like, I mean, who was it? Was it Ronda Rousey? Did she start Oh, she didn't blame. She didn't blame it. I mean, I think what do they say? There's excuses and reasons. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. The people who have reasons usually don't make up excuses. They just go, "I got beaten." Yep. But they might have reasons. Yeah. Do you yeah. know what I mean? But the, completely. The well, excuses, there's always a reason. Yeah. You address the reason. Well, that, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, now, like when I went out and you know would start auditioning, and then when I got to LA, I got close to a bunch of roles, and you get down to the network test, and then and then then I had a really really dry period. And I was like, you know, shit, these buggers promised me that I was going to be a star and rah, rah, rah. And it's like, no, you need to go and work on your acting, buddy. Like, you're not a great actor. I mean, I can act, but I'm no fucking, you know, whatever. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very, that, that exercise, whatever field, if you can look yourself in the mirror, as you say, and have a good, honest chat and go, okay, where's the weaknesses in my game? Uh, let's improve. Let's surround myself around people that know more about me or can see a weakness and 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 no yes man someone who can go no 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 that needs work and this needs work and then that's the way to to improve and get better you know, and i think what you said there is exactly what happened with him he just um had to change like with him like i say this every time when people ask me about him if if you jumped on him while he was asleep when he was 18 he would still bash you yeah do you know what i mean it wouldn't, it wouldn't have mattered you would have jumped on him with another mate and he mm-hmm. would have still bash you yeah and for the top 15 20 30 guys in the world like if you're number 28 in the world and you're in the ufc he'd still bash every single guy you've ever known in your whole life mm-hmm. you know what i mean mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. so the fighting a lot of the times is not the problem gotcha but for whatever reason and this goes back to what you were saying earlier for whatever reason mm-hmm. it's like that's what everyone always focuses on. It's, yeah. They always, it's like, um, I've got to get better, so I've got to go and get this coach that does this thing. Yep. And they're they always looking at, at the fighting. And for the most part, a lot of those guys, the difference is not in that. The difference is in the stuff you were talking about before and like nobody tells you how to audition. Nobody mm-hmm. tells you what to do with your money. Nobody tells you. And for the most part, those guys, if you sit down and talk to them, like, they will fight like, like they will fight all of, like I'm not, not just Rob. Like any of those top ten mm. guys in the world will fight anyone at any stage mm-hmm. in the parking lot if they could. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just if you think you're tougher than them, they're mm-hmm. like, no, we could do this for fun. This would be Completely. getting paid as a Western commodity. You Completely. Know? Yes. So they'll do all of that. So the fighter in them, that's that that isn't that's, the yeah. problem. Yep. Like the the problem is that a lot of them don't know how to structure their life or how to how to even talk to their manager to talk to other people 
because that's not their skill set and they're not necessarily addressing the correct um, skill gaps. Completely. You know? Like, so I just look at it like, like he's a TAFE student. Yep. Like yourself, a good example. Like if we're sitting here talking about music and I say, cool, Axel, I'm going to leave you this paper here. <coughs> I want you to write me a thousand word essay on music. And I come back and I read it and you're dyslexic. Mm-hmm. And I go, you're a fucking idiot. Like, what a moron. And I walk out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But if we sit and listen to the podcast, you obviously know the subject content is not the problem. Mm. The skill gap is something else completely. Com- completely. Yeah. And so that's that's <coughs> the, the thing I think that a lot of fighters miss and a lot of people miss. Mm. Um, Craig Alexander was here, you know, the triathlete dude. Like, Craig Alexander. Oh, yeah, no, gun, no. gun triathlete. Yeah, right. like, I don't know much about him. Um, he won like the... The Hawaii Ironman three times and oh, wow. blah blah blah. Oh, like, serious heavyweight, yeah, gotcha. yeah, just like big times. Some like, sorry, Craig. Yeah, he's <laughs> he's um he was he did the podcast and he was um talking about how for people of that skill set, being top ten in the world is relatively comfortable. Mm-hmm. Like for someone like myself, if I was top ten in the world at anything, I'm I fucking I'll take that. But, <laughs> but he goes, if you can get to top ten, a lot of the times you have the skill set to be number one. But, and I'm paraphrasing him somewhat, but it, it's the thing, like, but it's not necessarily the training because, you know, like the, the, those Ironman distances, like three and a half kilometer swim, 180 kilometer run, I mean, Real. ride. So, yeah. Yeah. And then a 42 kilometer run all on the same day. Not in a lifetime, not in a lifetime, on the same day. <laughs> so if you, if you can even get through that at a, at a top 10 oh, pace, you're, respect. yeah, you're right up there. But the difference is in like, are you good with your wife? Is your relationship good with your wife? Are you getting home and getting to bed on time? Or are you eating the right foods? Uh, is your, are you based in the right circumstances financially? Completely. You know, or, are you, or for example, are you taking races you shouldn't be taking? Yeah. Or fights that you shouldn't be taking so that you can pay bills when you're not ready so it's affecting your performance or yep. you're racing too many times or fighting too many times? Are you coming home and fighting with your wife mm. and it's not you're not getting the right sleep and you're not in the right mindset completely all of that and that's the that's the stuff I think a lot of musicians a lot of athletes a lot of young business guys don't know yeah and I say guys be gender neutral term like women women whatever like that's probably I think the, the biggest gap like I see young work with young footballers as well and I see that like they can all play football mm-hmm. they're like there's no question, mm. but it's like all the stuff they're doing outside completely of the, of that. That's that's yeah, that's fascinating. That's something that uh, that I've really admired in fighters to see their humility. I mean, it's such a fascinating sport, and you know, and such a bloody demanding sport. But particularly with fighters, and I just got you know about five or six years ago, I just became a massive fan of UFC. But to see the mental preparation and you speak to, you know, you watch Joe Rogan's podcast or you watch Robin Black or you watch bloody um, Dan Hardy or whatever else. And, and and when they speak to fighters and listening to their mental preparation, because you're right, I mean, they're all bloody beautiful athletes and can yeah, do it. They all know how to fight. Yeah. Completely. But but it's, it's that honest mental game. <coughs> And that is fascinating. I find that absolutely fascinating to go, okay, there's a weakness here. Or, I mean, watching Mark Hunt on your podcast, I mean, the fact that he was getting on the booze and getting on the pipe and smoking durries, you know, and still going out and bloody and, and knocking people through the wall. Um, but it came a point where it was like, okay, there's a weakness here. Or even when his wife called him before that bloody divorce, you know, he was like, I want a divorce a month out of, or a week out of the fight, you know, and, and, and to understand that. Yeah, you've got natural ability and you're great at what you do, but those other things, external things, they all need to come together, and um, and that's where that's where you go from ten to five to one, I suppose, and, and to look at yourself in the mirror and have those honest conversations. Yeah, right? yeah, for sure. Yeah, just um, going back to where Fab was saying with the races, whether they take a race they shouldn't or a fight that mm-hmm. they shouldn't take, and that does that happen in acting as well? Like sometimes you'll take a show that <coughs> yeah. is not the best for you. Or- yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean. Um, um, uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, sometimes, sometimes a, a role might come up, or yep. I mean, I, I didn't watch Home and Away growing. I mean, I watched a little bit as a kid, um, but then you know, then if I'm 
on a trajectory of, of being a musician or, or wanting an acting role, that sort of stuff, and then I get offered a full-time role on a soapy, you think, ah, it's a soapy, but then you go, actually, hang on, I'm pretty, you know, it's a bloody wage and it's, yeah. it's a great opportunity and it has been, you know. Or you might get offered to promote a product. You might have to bloody promote toothpaste yeah, yeah. Or, or fucking Danny paper, yeah. you know, and you're trying to be a credible musician when you sit yeah, at home so workshopping, sort of. but it's like I can make 20 grand from doing an ad or I can go and make 20 grand from playing a year in bloody pubs. Yeah. What are you going to fucking do? You know, and so, so brand, I don't know, there's, there's, there's brand awareness and making sure, okay, so, I mean, I, I've kind of, you know, I've, I suppose taking myself for example, you know, I, I count myself as a musician, and yeah, and then and, and I mean, I've become a buddy, you know, done a bit of TV hosting and, and acting and music and a couple of things, but primarily, you know, when I started out, I was going to be a musician, and I would want to align myself with brands that that was on my message or on my sort of, you know, on my on my pathway or, or what I want the public to see of me. Yeah, you yep. know, and there's no way I'd start doing that. But when you get out in the big wide world and realise you got rent to pay. And yeah, you either you might teach or you might do whatever else to try and supplement the income. If you get offered a, something that doesn't realign with your brand, props to you if you say no and you don't want to do it or you don't want to promote something. But there's a you know there's a life aspect of getting the bills paid and bloody. Surviving. Yeah, well, I think I think Craig was saying that wasn't he? That with some of the younger guys who take races, it's your main financially or even the young fighters, financially, they feel that pressure, so they'll yeah they'll take a fight or or a race or something like that. That's not not going to help them in the long run. Yeah. One of the things we did with, with Robin with some other of our athletes, and we just coined the phrase. I mean, I'm sure that somebody much smarter than me is probably goes, no, actually, the equation's like this, but I don't know. But I'm just saying, like we say, like, are you like a leverage fighter or are you a championship fighter? And so, and there's nothing wrong with either one and they're not mutually exclusive. Mm-hmm. And and you might start off as one and become the other, mm-hmm. you know, but you've got to kind of know which one it is that you're doing. And this was before Rob went on his run. And we said to him, like, because say, for example, if and I'll use this, if you're a leverage fighter, what do I mean by that? means like, I think then you leverage your career off your fighting. So you might go and say, I, um, I'm going to fight in the UFC, or I'm going to fight in Bellator or something, and I'm going to try and get maximum exposure, and I'm going to make sure that I want to speak to, for argument's sake, Titus as my manager. I'm going to tell him, dude, book me on... This, this, that, and the other, because I want to get my exposure while I'm getting ready to fight. And the biggest thing for me is to be on as many radio shows, on TV, whatever, because I know that realistically I'm contracted to five fights in the UFC or three fights. I, I don't know how well I'm going to do. Because you, you know, like deep down in here, you know, like, how good you are, how, mm-hmm. you know, like, kind. maybe, maybe you don't. But mm-hmm. then you go, all right. I'm going to leverage off that. I'm going to open up a personal training business as well. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to do that. And in between fighting, and I'm going to do da 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 Or like a championship fighter guy, like you go, no, I want to fight. They give me number 15 or give me number eight to pick. I'm going to pick number eight. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to pick the hardest guy and I'm going for the title. And people say, you shouldn't be in the fight game unless you're going to be the champion. And I think like, it's fucking stupid. Like, do you know how many fighters there are in the world? Like, sure. like if I, I can't say, and you can't, you might start off going, I'm just going to be a leverage fighter. Mm-hmm. And then you, you win three in a row and mm. you can reassess that. It's mm. not mutually exclusive, like I said. But again, someone like Rob, when we posed that to him, and this was only, I think, I think he, he just beat Uriah, Uriah Hall. In, yeah. He just had beat him. So it was not, he wasn't deep into his run and he was like, what, like, like that's not even like a, like a question. Do you know uh-huh, what I mean? Uh-huh. And, and it's not like, he doesn't think like, a, there's no, there's no like, it's not based off a thing where he's like, oh, fight anyone or whatever. No, no, he's, no. his things are just like, I don't, I don't even like, are there people that do the other one? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. I'm like, yeah, but there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. It's just understanding that, like you said, you might have to go, do you, you know, da, 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 and he's like, I don't want to do any of that shit. I, the only problem for me is, am I going to get enough money? And because of the skills that, and talents that he had, I know that he, if he did the right things, could get to, and I don't want to say a champion, because a champion's like a title. Do you know what I mean? Mm. It's almost, 
it's almost like <clears throat> there's champions that haven't owned a belt. That's it. That's what I was going to yeah. say. To exactly. me, yeah. if you fight Chris Weidman, you, doesn't matter if you're fighting him when you're number five, you're number six. That's a championship fight. Yep. You know, yep. Rob versus Chris is is title fight. No oh, matter. That's a great fight. Yeah, but, but you know what I mean. That's yeah. a that's a title fight. No matter where. Romero versus Rockhold, title fight. Yep. Rockhold versus I don't know any of those dudes. Yep. yep. It's a title fight. 100%. No matter. There's no. 100%. Yep. Like actors, there's some actors that did a shit job and you go, fuck, I'll watch him anyways. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> and he knew straight away like, that he was a championship fighter. So, yeah, he did know. Yeah, oh, that was going to be a question. Sorry to interrupt. But, but no, no. Does, does when, it, when did he know from the from the outset or did, he, did you see him after his losses to make that switch in his mind to go, you know what? No, nah, I can do this. I'll, I'll tell did you. did he always have it? Me, just from knowing him. Yep. Um, <clears throat> and I don't want to put too much out on him because yeah, he's yeah, still yeah. at such a yep. vulnerable stage of his career. But yep. I don't think that he's – he never, ever, ever, I've never, ever, 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 ever seen him buckle about fighting someone. Is that right? Yeah. No, no. The, the thing to fight is not that. The, the doubts that he had was like, I'm not going to make enough money by doing this, gotcha. which is normal unless yep. you're – fucking moron yep. you know what I mean yep. but it was never like it was never ever ever never doubting his skill or his ability nah he was like always like when when he was going through it <clears throat> and he was like hoping like when say for example they said oh Jacare what do you think of you and Jacare and they asked me first and like like me I wouldn't fight Jacare if I had a pitchfork <laughs> and a fucking flamethrower you know <laughs> And, and, the fucking gun. Yeah. and I said to him, um, like, uh, I was on the phone and I said to him, what do you think of you and Jacare? And he's like, because we knew there was a fight coming. We just didn't know who. Yeah, right. And he was sitting there and he's like, like, oh, for the people him. don't see. They just like thumbs up. <laughs> like, there's no like, um, I don't like Jacare, whatever. He's like, cool, good fight. <laughs> yeah. And then... Um, there was talk that maybe Jacare, not Jacare, Jacare is like that as well. Like he's like, we met him, da 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 da. And he's like a really nice, is he? Yep. humble, yep. sweetheart of a dude, but there's like fucking zero quit in him. Like you will need all the gasoline in the flamethrower with a pitchfork <laughs> to make him quit because <laughs> yeah. he's not. And uh, we, but there was some contract dispute with him and we right. didn't know if he was going to sign it. Gotcha. And then there was talk about like, Maybe it was going to be, I don't know if it was Weidman or maybe it was going to be Romero. Who was it going to be instead of Jacare at the time or whatever? And at, what, at what point, sorry, what point had this? You hadn't started a camp or anything. You, it wasn't halfway through the camp. Where you, we don't really have a camp. So okay. we're always training all the time. Yeah, right. Yeah. Gotcha. And he, he he was just like, I... Bring me whoever. Yeah, like, I just want to fight. Yeah, gotcha. I, I just want to fight. I just yep. want to fight. Support my family you know, and get in Yeah, but, but more than that also, like, because at this stage he knew he was going to fight, so he was going to get the money. But he was just like, I just want to fight and I want to fight, like, the toughest guys. Like, you know, Jacare certainly is that. So bring Jacare, bring Romero, bring whoever. It's not, it's never, and, and it doesn't matter because, like, mm-hmm. you know, people don't understand. Like, people go, like, Oh, it was such and such an easier fight? It was Uriah Hall an easier fight than Jacare? And you're like, are you are you out of your fucking mind? Like, <laughs> like how is that an easy fight? Completely, you know, you know what I mean? Like, completely. So, um, or not even your whoever. Yeah, you know, yeah there's yeah, no yeah. easy fight. Yeah, yeah this guy yeah. is like trying to kill you. Yeah, you know, there's no easy fight. Um, when you ask me if it's in camp, we don't have like a camp. We train year round, <clears throat> and then so we get them. They're always fit, always ready to go. Right. And then there's six to eight weeks mm-hmm. that they might tell us you're going to fight Romero. Or you're going to not six, not six to six to eight yeah, weeks out. Yeah, d- d- depends depends on who and depends on how. Gotcha. Like when, when he had to fight Romero, he got the job offer, so yep. to speak. Yep. Six weeks out to yeah. fight Romero because he was supposed to. I know because no, Romero stepped up for Rockhold in Perth, didn't he? Because that's when that's when Rob Staff kicked in. Yeah, that was right. a different fight because yeah, yeah. he fought Romero in ah, July so, yeah. of last year. Right, gotcha. Yeah, okay. and so he fought Jacare in Kansas. Yep, and the turnaround, he had a little break, yep. and then they rang us and they said, "Do you want Romero in six weeks for the interim belt?" Right, and he was yes, yes, gotcha. I do. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, right. And so right. there's, he's always got to stay ready. Gotcha. Um, I guess it's no different to your job if you're serious about it. You yeah. know what I mean? You can't. They can't ring you and go, 
hey, we got an audition. You got this is yep. this is your look. Yeah, you can't weigh 150 kilos. No, no, 100. percent And they turn up and they're looking like this at you. Completely, you, you catfished them. Yeah, completely. <laughs> <laughs> you, <laughs> totally. You know what I totally, mean? Totally, 100. You can't do that. And, no. And that was another thing that we changed with him because, like, you know, the camps that people, the yep. fighters have, was like, dude, if you're a plumber, you don't go. I fixed eight pipes. I'm done for the rest of the year. Completely. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, 100%. You're doing that all the time. And if, yeah. and if you don't want to train all the time, and it doesn't, don't get me wrong, look, we're pretty, like, we're not done. We have, we're pretty methodical. All these trainings on sp- spreadsheets. We know everything that he's doing. Yeah. Um, there'll be times where we're not doing, um, there'll, there'll be certain times we're concentrating on certain things throughout the year. Yeah. But if at any time you feel that this is unfair, mm. if at any time you feel that this isn't cool, Go for a drive around like the building sites, and there's a dude that changes all the portal loose. <laughs> you know, and um, not the guy that owns a company, <laughs> the, the guy that has the to change the fucking portal loop that is on, you know, like out like, here's like 45 degree days, yeah. you know, and he would spill like a hundred people's shit on him. <laughs> all right, go, go, cry that guy a river, and Absolutely. go, yeah, you know what, I had to get up at like nine o'clock and do some training sessions, 100%. see my wife, and then see my kids, and then do the evening session. <laughs> yeah, exactly, you know? And the exactly. guy would be like, yeah, that's fucking horrible, yeah, man. Fuck. I've just been cleaning other people's shit for 12 hours. 100%. You know, 100%. so that that's probably the the thing. I, I, don't, I don't think it's any different, I think, to any other industry. You can't... No, it's a good point, because uh, uh, just to bring it back to the acting... Um, I would see mates like I. I didn't really want to or pursue to be an actor. I kind of fell into it and then realised yep, I, I wanted to check it out. But you, you see, act like I saw people around me in LA that were working out five or six times a week, eating well, not in the grog, sleeping well, and I was like, oh shit, this is this is this is what you got to do. You got to be game fit every single day because you've got a phone call going right. We've got an audition with X Y Z tomorrow, nine o'clock. Here are the sides. It's nine at night. You know, get there. And and you can't turn up looking sloppy. And no, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that was, uh, I sort of struggle with that. Like I'm... But you're a musician background. Yeah, musician you. background, which is late nights, you know, and causing a bit of trouble and having a good time. Um, but then the acting game was, yeah, and uh, treating it like... Um, and the musician, you know, being a, mus- being a musician, something that I saw at, at, act- at, at music school was these guys, the older guys, they'd be doing five, six, seven hours of practice a day. That, that's what I was going to say because that musician might not be this, but definitely they're practicing all the time. Oh, and they're game ready. Whereas, whereas I have had the attitude of going in there, you know, riding on a bit of natural talent and not doing the hard work. And sometimes that works, and sometimes you fall flat on your ass. And after you know, and after as I got older and made a lot of mistakes, I realised that if you're going to take this, and that's something I've taken from martial arts as well, to see these guys, how hard they work and how ready they are and how serious and dedicated they are, even their shit days where uh, you can't go, I've done a month. Like Personally, I'll work really hard and I can train five days a week uh, you know, and, and be consistent for about a month and a half and I go, cool, wash my hands and then I'll go and drink a whole lot of piss and eat a Big Mac or something and then go backwards for a week and go, oh, okay, we're back to stage one. So that continuity I've always struggled with. And that's why watching and getting interested in fighters and speaking to you guys to understand what it takes and, and to take that mindset into any other field, that's what that's what it takes. You know, because there's going to be a bloke next door who is doing another hour, yeah, you know, yeah. or, or writing more or, or, or speaking to him or surrounding himself with better people or whatever else. And there's always someone... You know, and, and you can't, you, you, you know, you, you, you got to have that in mind. That you know. One of our mentors is a guy that owns uh, Kaplan Homes. He's a builder. And okay. He's a builder. Wow. It's not, it's not like a, I don't know, it's not a like multiplex, but it's, or Mervac, but it's, it's like a bigger building company that I own. I'll tell you that <laughs> now. Kaplan Homes, yeah, he's good, good, like known him for a long time, good wrestler. Mm-hmm. Um, he wrestled all his life growing up and then he opened up, uh, Andrew Canatley's name is he opened up a, a building company. And uh, people look at him now, and he's you know successful in whatever terms you want to look at it. Like he's got a lovely family, thriving business, seems to have a good work-life balance. But I've known him for a long time, uh-huh. and I think like when that dude, he was working like a, I don't even know if I'm allowed to say this, but he was working. He may or may not have been working a full-time job at a particular building company and working in his own building company at Jesus. night. Yeah, right. So working maybe 18, 19 hours a day, you know. And now you see him. Like this, you know, and I think like uh, that dude doesn't go. I have built fifteen houses this year. Uh, this will be good. We're good for now. 
you know, he's like always like, nah, I've got to get what's the marketing's not right and this isn't right and let me have a look at the payroll. Yeah. And if you, and, and but you know what? This is the other thing and this goes back to that leverage thing. And the, I don't think there's anything wrong with you going, well, if I build three houses a year and I sell them and I flip it, mm-hmm. um, I can make 130 grand a year yep. and I'll do that every year for the rest of my life. Yep. And I'm happy with that because yep. I'll get a good balance. I think there's nothing wrong with that as long mm. as we don't mix arguments, mm. as long as we understand that that's what you're going to do. Don't mm-hmm. be surprised that you're not on however much money a guy that owns a building company. Completely, like, yeah. You know? And, yeah. And I, I feel that people kind of mix those arguments. Like, there's nothing wrong with it. You could turn around and go, I don't want to do what Rob does. I don't want to do five sessions a day, seven days a week. I do. He doesn't do five sessions seven days a week. But on the big days, they're five sessions a day. Jesus. On the smaller days, on Sunday, it's one. On the other days, it's two to three, you know? Gotcha. And, and if, and everything's, and, and then, and then, and I'm on him for all of it, you got to write down each session. And we have like a little equations that you do for like the load and the uh, rate of perceived exertion for each session. Mm-hmm. And your resting heart rate. And then nothing, it's nothing, it's nothing out of this world. But you still have to record it, and mm-hmm. I make him manually record it, and I'm sure someone out there's go, you know, Fab, there's an app that can do that, but I don't want him to use the app. Yep. I want him to have to sit down and go, this is my thing, and this is what it did, because there's a mental thing to that, you know yep. what I mean? Without a doubt. And then um, he has to record what he ate. We don't, and then we just look over everything and make sure that the food and the training all add up. Yep. You don't have to do that. Yep. You can just, Mark doesn't do that, <clears throat> and he's extremely successful. Sure. And uh, Rob, though, the formula for his success is that. Gotcha. For somebody else, it might not be that. Yep. And yep. then there might be somebody else that goes, man, I don't want to do any of that shit. I want to have a nice balance mm-hmm. because he's out of, like, on Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, we're together, he and I, for about 14 hours a day, just driving around to each session. Jesus. There's better things to do than be with me for that many hours. <laughs> you know what I mean? No sure. one's... My parents were never that with me for that long. <laughs> so... There's people that don't want to do that. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yep. But you can't and then you might say, I want to have I want to have three fights in the UFC. Yep. Whatever happens, then run my personal training business and I'm happy with that. And that's cool. Yep. And that's fine. And you don't have to be world champion and you can be extremely successful. But you're not going to be world champion. Yeah. You know, that's yep. yeah. That's just the difference. That's all. Mm. You know? But when you've got such a full on schedule like that, um, Talking earlier, we were talking about um, how other things, you know, top fighters of getting the other things in their life, you know, all the ducks in, in, in a row. Um, with Rob's intense schedule like that, uh, how how is that balance? I know he's big into gaming and he's got three kids. Five. Oh, that's right. He's a do- yeah. He's Five a- kids, yeah. At 26. 27. That year makes a massive difference. <laughs> Jeez, I'm 37. I can't bloody commit to a fucking telephone bill. <laughs> uh, so my point, uh, my question was, is is getting that work life balance? Like you, you want to be world champion, you've got to you're giving you know 90 percent of your energy into that. How, how does he do that, or how do you incorporate that? Because yeah, I I think like first of all, I don't know if you hot and dawn but I'm like a barrel of fun <laughs> as a person you know I, I don't do like I don't me personally I'll just say this because like I'm kind of in charge of looking at that and I'm not we don't have like a head coach in our structure we have like a bunch of different coaches right. and we all have different roles and um, my role is sort of making sure that that stuff stays on point and uh I, I'm like a very like task orientated like person and I'm not I'm not like I'm not I'm not like the you wouldn't invite me to a dinner party and be like <laughs> and Fab's gonna take the dinner. No, I'm not I'm not I'm not like I'm not like that. Um, I'm sociable enough if in a setting like this, but yep. I'm very like this is what we have to do, yep. and this is what we're gonna do, and then we're gonna do that, then we're gonna do this. Gotcha. And to achieve about. this. Yep. Yeah. Gotcha. And I'm like that in my in my life in general. Mm-hmm. So like when we look, we sit down and we we'll look at like the hours in a day and what we're going to do. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the times, like say, for example, people go and there's nothing wrong. I'm just saying this is like uh, it works for us. It might not work if I was going to coach Eli. Mm-hmm. It might not work. Mm-hmm. And Eli is going to find a coach that's going to 
click with him completely you know so this is not mm. i'm not giving like a recipe for life but mm, mm. rob and i click with this and yep. we have the same and that quote. works yeah gotcha so we'll go all right man <clears throat> let's have a look at this we've got 24 hours in a day let's i'm going to allow for 10 for sleeping right yep and in that 10 you can manipulate it yeah see I'm, I'm not that I, bad yeah I'm not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> you can have an hour to play computer games and nine that, hours of sleep yeah. that's it yeah. and so i'll say well what are you going to do with those hours yeah so don't tell me that you don't have time to spend with your wife if you just spent six hours playing video games sure it's not training that got in the way yep it's and we don't call it training training we call it training work gotcha I'm you going know to so work. that that's already a different thing that's cool you know and then like <clears throat> you surround yourself with these people like Andrew Canatley from Kaplan Homes. We've got another dude named um, uh, Adnan Sabai. He's our uh, he's our accountant, you know, mm-hmm. Spectrum Wealth. Gun accountant, if you need an accountant. Okay, the, cool. The man. Awesome. Yeah, he's he's very, very good. I do need I've got one, but a <laughs> yeah, good one is Look, very important. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know later <laughs> on. But, but yeah, he's a gun, you know, and, and like guys like Titus as well. Like, yep. Um, not, not, even, not even other fighters, you know, just, just people like in general. And then you have... Like David Roberts is a guy that runs a program here. Guys like Eli, myself, whatever. You look at like, well, what do you do? It doesn't matter if you're a dad. You're a dad 24 hours a day. You know, mm-hmm. if uh, if you're a if you're a great accountant like who Adnan is. Adnan doesn't go 9 a.m. till 5 p.m. I'm finished. I'm done. Like mm. he's got like. Oh, his finger in he's got 10 fingers he's got 12 fingers in pies you know what I mean <laughs> gotcha. like and he's never off you know so really, yeah. you want to be successful in your career you have to have that sort of mindset completely but then my, my question then becomes you're going to do this training in these places and this time here you have for your wife and kids yep. Sophia his wife is extremely supportive but not just supportive because it's gone past that in the sense of like that's like Team Whitaker, you know what I mean. Yeah. So that that's where it starts. That's, that's ground right. zero. Absolutely. So you're all you as a unit. You're benefiting from this. Yeah, yeah. Do you get what I mean? Completely. So if um, so she understands that this has well, to she happen. She has a role in the whole thing as she, well. She's like completely essential role. Yeah. So then we we start to to look at that as in like okay, you got to come to train to work to training mm-hmm. these hours. Then you have. These hours off mm-hmm. and those hours off mm-hmm. are for you to spend with your family. Gotcha. If you so choose to go and do whatever, yep. Yep. it's not right, it's not wrong, do whatever you want. Yep. yep. But you are going to affect the time with your wife, yep. which is going to affect this, which is going to affect that. So Saturdays, for instance, he finishes training at 1.30. Mm-hmm. He's got from 1.30 all the way until we start training at 9 a.m., uh, 8.30, sorry, at Cronulla the next day. Gotcha. Do what with the, what you want. We finish training at 11 o'clock in Cronulla. Mm-hmm. You don't have to turn up until 10 o'clock the next day at Cronulla. Oh, wow. Gotcha. So, so you got these blocks of hours. Do with them as you will. Mm-hmm. You know, then you got these right. other blocks. Gotcha. But That's if you... Yeah. yeah, and the other <clears> thing is, like, say, for example, people go, oh, he doesn't do anything for recovery. He does do a lot of stuff for recovery. Mm-hmm. But the big thing is this. If you just sparred hard on Saturday and you went at, you, you, you'd say you're training for Romero now and you just did 25 minutes of hard sparring with some tough dudes and then you got another session the next morning and there's a reason why it's, there's a reason why they're done like this. Gotcha. Right? And then you want to go out and snort coke off hookers' backs and, he doesn't drink alcohol yeah. which sounds like a good, <laughs> sounds like a good night John Jones <laughs> but then then you're going to talk to me that oh now I want to go in the float lab or some shit for recovery and I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck are you talking about you know what I mean like what are yeah, you talking about totally. like there's not there's, that, that's not it's just fucking not stupid you Completely. know it's, it's stupid yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. Um, it's just balancing all of that and yeah. it's not it's not um it's really not that hard. It's, yeah, it's just, it's just discipline and that's a consistency. Consistency and discipline. Oh, that's uh, yeah. Does, two two very interesting words. That, does Rob uh, get <laughs> get invited to a lot of I don't know parties or events Red and stuff like and that? Yeah, yeah, yeah he does. Through yeah. and then like, luckily Titus from um, what's it? Six degrees. Six degrees. Yep. Very very good manager. Yep. Um, shout out to Titus. Yep. Um, for all six listeners, two of them are my parents. But, <laughs> yeah, the other two. But, but uh, they don't speak English. So. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but uh, 
Yeah, so guys, Titus works really well with us. Whereas yeah. a lot of times, I see and I see this so much. You know, first I see, I see it's just a relationship. All relationships, it's no different. And I see like power struggles in people's relationships. So, say for example, Titus works really well in that he'll get something. He's got outcomes he has to achieve. Obviously, financial ones. Mm-hmm. He gets a percentage of robs. Da da da. But Titus is smart enough to understand that without Rob winning fights, nothing. Th- he gets a that bigger percentage of nothing. Completely. Completely. You know? Yep. So he will say to me, Fab, what do you think of Rob doing A, B, C, and D on this day? And it's not because the thing is just like I, I, I kind of talk to all the coaches and I talk to Rob. Mm-hmm. And then I might get back to Titus and say, the easiest day to do it would be this day. Right. You know, and then I might have to Rob might Rob might turn around and go first because he doesn't watch thing like that. He, first mm. of all, I don't know who this person is. Yep. Second of all, I don't know that there's such a show. Yep. I wasn't aware radio was still around. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like there'll be a whole bunch of shit, and right. then and then for real, like it'll be well, Rob, you got to do it. Yep. You know, uh, Titus has already moved ten things around for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, we can't move training. That's one of the things we don't do because mm-hmm. like. And it sounds, again, it sounds fatalistic, but we always say, like, a, a, a missed session is a missed session. You would never, ever make it up. So if it's from 10 till 11, that goes down into the diary as a missed session. You might have done something else, gotcha. made up for it. Right, right. But you missed that session. Don't right. kid yourself. You fucking missed that session. Yep, right. Um, it's, <clears throat> it's true. Like, if you think of it, like, if you slept all through Sunday... And then you did whatever you're going to do on Sunday, on Monday. Completely. You still miss Sunday. Completely. Don't, you know what I mean? <laughs> don't like, give yourself. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. we always we try not to move training <clears throat> at all. And then when it, then then I got to, then you say to him like this is what this is why it's important. Mm. And then you might Titus is very good at that as well, where he'll send the information through and say this is the radio show you're going on. This is who the guy was. This is what he did. Da 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 and. Probably Sophia will read it to Rob. Yep. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And he, he, he's very smart. He's not dumb. It's just his skill set is punching people yeah. in the face. Yep. yep. You Completely. know, he doesn't watch, like, no. doesn't listen to the radio, talk back radio. Or nothing. Totally. He's got no idea. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, he gets invited to it, but it just comes down to the other thing people don't <clears> understand, and this is where it comes down to your leverage fighter, your championship fighter. They go, you got from 1.30 off to... You don't have to train till 10 a.m. So maybe you could fit in three events in that day. But that's like the time that he'd be spending with his kids. Completely. Spending with his wife. That re-centers him. Yeah. That um, makes you feel better. Like the other day, I had to go. It wasn't even, it wasn't even bad. It was just I work a lot of hours. Mm-hmm. And usually I have like that period off where I see my family or go to the beach or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I had to do some shit. And I can't remember what it was. It was something like go to a friends barbecue or something gotcha, sorry yeah. you might be listening <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I had to go to a friend's barbecue and we're not close but we're not close enough for me to say no if you know what I mean yeah gotcha yeah 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 yeah. yeah. and I had to go and then the rest of the week I was like down really yeah because like those four hours when you when you work a lot and you've got four hours free sure. you, you would know this like 100% yeah you got those four hours free and then they took up those four hours. You get resentful and it's a, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. you're just physically tired because yeah. that would have been the time that you just, your, your mind. Completely. Think, and you go to a barbecue and you got to, like, I can't be at a barbecue going, all right, guys, so what's the fucking outcome of this? Like, <laughs> you know? So you're still being, you're still yeah. being nice. And yeah, you're going to be pleasant yeah, trees and that sort of stuff. That's exhausting in itself. Yeah. It's exhausting. That's exactly right. And then you meet <clears throat> someone's auntie that's a third cousin that, and sold a donkey to someone in the village oh, back home. They're just fucking yeah. on the inside. <laughs> yeah. And and if if I had nothing to do, then, yeah. then it's bearable. Yeah. But that was my time to sure. to recover. And with Rob, that's what people don't get as well. Like you, you know, that's his family time. Yeah. yeah. You know. And then another thing that we had to do was just to make it simple. Is like quantify what each session's worth. So work out on a monetary figure what each session's worth so if they're going to make you do a uh 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 what it, whatever like a show or an appearance or something yeah right okay. this is how much uh, okay it's going to cost you not how much you have to charge them oh that's interesting but this is how much it's going to cost you if you go there yeah wow okay you know what i mean yeah, gotcha. when you lose 
and you will eventually lose, yep. they're not going to give a fuck. 100%. And, and if you lost because you did, say, three weeks of ship for them, yeah. <clears throat> they're not going to come back and go, hey, listen, really sorry, let us compensate you. you know <laughs> yeah, what I mean? completely. So completely. it's just looking at that stuff and, and just being consistent, having discipline, having like... Uh, but, but again, I stress... I have not the answers. Mm-hmm. This is just what works How for you us. Work. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And um, most of the guys that are around us are like that. Like um, guys like another dudes like uh, the guy named Brian Doyle and runs Doyle's Upholstery. Owns Doyle's Upholstery. Okay. Older guy, probably about sixty years old. And uh, he's a mentor of ours as well, and uh, really good with small business and everything. But most of the people like Marilla Bustamante guys, there's a UFC fighter. Most of the guys, like, the secret to success is, like, hard work, Mm -hmm. consistency. Mm -hmm. And I think being disciplined to what you're doing, like, and by that I mean, like, my my concept of discipline and my thing might be very different to yours. Like, you you might be, you're not undisciplined because you went out and drank and got up late because you're a musician. Mm. It's totally different. Yeah. Like, I would be undisciplined because the gig started... At ten, yep, and you go, where's Fab? Yeah, he's asleep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> completely, completely. He's, he's like well into his fifth dream. You know? <laughs> yeah. So it's a totally. It's not. They're not. It's that, yeah. I it's, got you. It doesn't make you undisciplined. Yeah, yeah sure. In my opinion. Anyways. Yeah. No, no. I see what you're saying. It's not. It's just totally different things. <clears throat> yeah. Um, speaking of interviews and all that sort of stuff, what what's the perception in Australia of MMA? And do people know, like, you know, I mean, I saw Rob on the project on Channel 10 or something. They're like, oh, the way they introduce it, you know, he's some crazy street fighter that, you know, and we've got a world champion. And, and um, I mean, I, I personally find it annoying not being able to talk about mixed martial arts with people or something you're really, really into because people don't know about it. They don't have an interest in it. It looks like a, a fucking brutal sport that you go in there and just try and cut each other's throat. But it's it's... Completely not. Um, well, it is. It is. It, it, it is. It is. But but it's it's a you know it's it's a dance. It's a discipline. There's technique. There's will. There's so much to it. Um, Australian audiences. How do you guys find the response? You want to go first? Uh, I wouldn't have enough probably knowledge in what other people. Well, you know, I mean, a general guy down at the pub. Yep. I think. Do you know what I mean? I. It would only be a small percentage, but they don't yeah. really know much about it. They just, I think it's just natural that human beings like violence still. Yeah. They, they don't need to know much about it. Yeah. They just know one guy's trying to rip the other guy's head off. So as long as it's not them, they'll love to watch it. And, do you know what I mean? And whatnot, but I don't know. I think it would, it would more of a question for Fab, what what maybe some professional people think compared to... Well, are you? I don't think, like, it's not anywhere near as mainstream like it's real hard to get yeah to get like proper big corporate sponsorship and that really especially yeah. in Australia um, but in general you know what the thing is as well and I, you know what we were talking before is people just love to hate yep like when Rob put like Rob did an armbar now and people are like correcting his armbar <laughs> oh was that on the unibet yeah. thing yeah and you, oh, and I, I just, just think like yeah. dude why would you say anything so it's so, like well, he's posted something and then you've got you, you've, you've got unibet to- posted it Right, and then their they're their consumers, fun. their customers have what given him advice on what yeah, he so, so, on there. But but it happens all the time. Like he'll be yeah. doing something, and they'll go, um, "I can see the way you're standing, and you're holding your hands too low." But I, dude, I've been out in the street with him, and people have said to him. Um, you know what you need to do? You need to sit behind your jab more or something, shit like that. Oh, <laughs> you know? That yeah. fucking... Yeah. 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 Oh, <laughs> who's got the... Fu- who, I don't know. In the, their the, right mind. The best one you told me was the guy who sent a message to Rob saying like, Maybe it's not best to go to the ground with Jacare. Yeah. Like, they, they sent Mr. Mr. President to us yeah. like, don't, don't go to the ground really? with Jacare. You know, and, and to Alex, it was to Alex they sent the message. Really? Yeah, to yep. Alex. And Alex was his jiu-jitsu coach, yeah, yeah, right? Know. Because Alex yep. is like a retard and he's, <laughs> he's going to tell... <laughs> yeah. We've never seen Jack oh, fight. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So, wow. yeah, but... but that, pe- takes, that takes naivety and just balls to fucking... <laughs> people do that, though. People like... Really? Um, so I think it starts off... I honestly think it's hard for people to see other people do well for whatever reason. Yeah, that's an Australian thing, I think, too. Yeah, I... Or just it's know. human nature. Yeah, I, th- I, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then and then it's hard, I think, um, 
just because I, I kind of float between a few different, wear a few different hats and mm-hmm. I work at TAFE and da 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 da. Mm-hmm. And there's some people in, say, in the corporate TAFE world that are really receptive to it mm-hmm. and they really see the discipline, da 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 da. And they can, and they're usually a smarter kind of people that can understand that. Like, say, for example, mm. we're talking now, you're a musician, I'm like, I'm one of Rob's coaches, and, and there's so much similarities, just like it's not that big a deal. Mm-hmm. But then there's other people that, I don't know, due to their own insecurities, MMA, by its very nature, it is brutal. You know yeah, what I mean? Yes, it yeah, is yeah. it is rough and it is thing and everything. And it's easy to grab that, stereotype the people, make yourself feel good, and these guys are fucking idiots. Yep. And you can't have um <clears throat> you can't they they're not listening to us. Yeah. No, and I'm not even a fighter. Yeah. And this is the other thing. Sometimes I'm talking to people and they're talking to me like there was a guy that did a try to do a story and he, he came in and he had this whole thing about how um he wanted to do a story about who we were and how tough it was and da-da-da. And, like, all of us have, like... And, again, it's not anything bad, but all of us have university degrees. Completely. Do you know? And, yep. and You're not a bunch of thugs. No, but if, if we were, so be it. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yep. And that would yep. be a yep. great story in itself. Sure. But I was like, dude, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> you know? and, yeah. and he's saying to me... Uh, he's asking me something. And I said something about, like... Something about, like, the dichotomy of, of the MMA athletes... And he said something to me like, and Alex was, I think it was Alex was with me or somebody else with me. And the guy said like, yeah, don't, don't use those words. And I said to him, oh. yeah, like full on. Yeah. Like, I, I won't name the guy. I won't name the guy. Hey, so, so you, you, you said, what well, he, he started to, can you, sorry, can you say, say that again? So the guy, the guy came in, right? And yeah. they wanted to do this story. Right. Like, was it just really, was it to make out like you were a small gym that, do you know what I mean? Is it a journalist? In that, but you have a you have a world champion there training and I'm, I'm just I'm careful. I don't, yeah, want, yeah, I don't yeah. want to put it yeah. out on the dude. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. But, but, but a guy comes in to do a story about Rob and about the team and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, and then what he starts giving you advice. Like he he wanted a story where we were like uh, he he had, he had a preconceived idea of what he wanted. Yeah, that and, we were and these, wasn't going to budge. Yeah, these, right like badass dudes and like gotcha, it gotcha. was really fucked because our gym yeah. our gym is a family gym can sure so completely. we have three year olds yep to all the way olds. from three years old to rob yeah and we got 70 year olds that do jiu-jitsu we have fundamentals classes like we got awesome thing and so the guy the guy's like blah blah blah, blah and he's interviewing me and i remember because i remember using that word but it, was, it wasn't like i i it wasn't like we're having a normal conversation now like mm. just how we're talking now mm. and he asked me something and i said like the dichotomy of who Rob is or just some I can't mm-hmm, remember right. and he told me no don't use those words and da 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 and I was oh, really? yeah it's going to ruin his story <laughs> oh, yeah. come on and, and I said to him what do you mean and he goes like I want, and he told me the story that he wanted to and we ah never, I gotcha. yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, I said yeah. to him but that that is not the story that's that's not who yep, we are man yep, yep. You know? and I'm, completely I'm, like, I'm, I'm a TAFE teacher and we run these TAFE programs and no I'm not going to Mm. I'm not Rob just turned down like an alcohol um, sponsorship yep because we're working with remote indigenous communities um, completely and That's you're stupid fucking idea. stupid yeah. you know what I mean completely. like obviously I didn't say it like this but <clears throat> my whole thing was like you, you're fucking dumb yeah. like you don't you don't get this yeah. yeah and I said to him like no nah, man we, we can't do what you're asking us to do we can't come out and no nah. like we can't and, and, and my, my point is that this guy had it like rock solid in his head. Mate, this guy is a tough dude that and Rob is as bad as tough as he get, but he if he's, he's very articulate, mm. he's intelligent, mm. he's not a moron. None of the team associated with us are. Like Al- Alex has got a law degree, you know. I've, Does he really well? Yeah, yeah, I've got some sort of degree that they let me have as well. We <laughs> just, just got through. Um Justin Lang, he was he had the Dean's medal from like from, from university. Wow. You know, the guy does exercise physiology. Like all the guys are like, if you yeah. speak to them, they're they're intelligent. Completely. They're they're not stupid. Yeah, yeah. And so, and the guys he's surrounded with, like you know, their own companies, and yeah. they're his mentors that he turns to. Yeah. And they wanted to paint this picture of Rob like being this. Yeah. So you see, you see a lot of that sort of. I mean, people just going, he's a bloody, you know. And so but I'm it's sure easier some, for them to deal with it. Yeah, completely. They, and they can't hole. handle yeah. it. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, personally, when I first saw it, I thought this is a re- 
really violent, hardcore sport. It I'm is. I'm not interested. It's it's too much. And then a mate dragged me to Boxing Works at Larry Papadopoulos. Yeah, I know Larry. I know Larry since I was a kid. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. So he dra- uh, a mate dragged me to um, to a class there. And I think Larry or Peter Graham might have been um, running the class. And I was like, holy shit. And, you know, was gassed out by the warm-up, you know, completely never... Uh, you yeah, know, never trained like that before, and then started coming back, and and then then uh, 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 started training with a guy called Jeff O'Hara, um, beautiful, awesome dude, great great coach, um, and then after sort of you know doing a bit of boxing, then do a bit of kickboxing, and then I started to understand the discipline and the art and the fucking you know drilling and and the stuff you know the small amount I've been doing it for I don't know, five years on and off and. And, but it wasn't until then till I understood the concept and the technique and the mindset and all that kind of thing. And then I became a massive fan. And it was understanding what it takes and actually what's going on in the octagon, you know. Um, and trying to convince people or have that conversation with strangers, they can't take that leap or they can't. And I understand why. Like, you know, it's not until you train or you understand physically what's going on and, and, and the line and different things you can do. Um, yeah, you know, to, to to appreciate the sport. So yeah, it it is hard to to bring people in, and I wish I wish I don't know how to make that leap. But a lot and of people bring don't want to. Yeah, yeah, a lot, a no, lot of people, yeah, you're right. A lot of people want to. The same as like say, for example, I don't know. I'm, I, I don't know. Much to my mother's dismay, she paid for me to do uh, Spanish guitar. Right? <laughs> Fuck me, <that> was, <laughs> <laughs> she should have grabbed that money and shut it off the cliff. <laughs> it would be better. I, I I can't you know how you know when you there was yep. a, there's a there's a subject when I did my diploma at TAFE mm-hmm. and it's called uh, exercise to music right and you know the and you're gonna laugh at this right you know the part when you go five six seven eight and one two three four and I can't hear that gotcha oh, you can't you say the rhythm you the I, I don't know the rhythm that I can't. Is it the pitch? It's not a pitch or it's a rhythmic thing? Or? Well, I don't know the difference right. between the two to <laughs> begin with. <Cool. laughs> and, and I can't hear, like, you know when people's songs are starting? Yeah. And, and like... The, ah, and, and you, you know it's the end. Yeah, it's, it's end five, verse, six, seven, eight, eight and one, problem. two, three. Yeah. Or I, I cannot. Really? No, no, man. Like, well, not it's, even. It's, it's interesting because being an athlete yourself and understanding that kind of timing or, or I'm rhythm. I'm coordinated or, everything. Yeah, but but that internal or um, that, that sense of rhythm... With a different instrument. If I had to dance, I would watch people. people. I was going to say, can you dance? No. <laughs> no, not at all. And, and everyone in my family. I was going to say, except being South American and not being able to dance. So <laughs> yeah. Everyone in my family are musicians, both sides. Is that right? And yeah, you, yeah, you, I, I'm you weren't broken. given that chance. I think I'm pretty sure somebody drowned me or something when I was a baby. <laughs> yeah. But my, my mum put me in Spanish guitar and one, I didn't like it. Yeah. But, and people go, maybe you didn't like it. That's why. But no, no. But like, I never got past like even the scales. Like I never. Gotcha. I never even like. I and I used to do like private classes, mm-hmm. and I, I did practice probably more because I've always been like pretty diligent ever since I can remember with whatever I did. Yeah, right. Like pretty like thing, and I practiced probably like other little kids would have. Yeah. But I never got past the fucking scales, <laughs> and I could never like I remember memorizing. Um, Skip to my Lou or some shit like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah, Skip to my Lou had those things where it had like one note and it had two squ- circles on the note. Right, like a semi brief or a, a, hang on, so uh, like a, a minimum. Um, God, now so it's a note with, with, with a dot next to it. Yeah, but you what? had to press two at once. Ah, oh, so like a chord or something. Or something or some ridiculous shit like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, that was, right. and that was too much for me. Uh, Fuck, what was it? What was it? How did we get onto that? I don't even know. Uh, Spanish guitar, uh, uh, rhythm, having uh, uh, that, that internal rhythm or struggling with that. I well, I don't have it. That's my yeah, point. Right, but I was going to say some shit about it. Why, why were we talking about rhythm? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, am, I am lost here. <laughs> That's a bit about podcasts, you know. I mean, I think you asked me my question. Yeah, it is just the I, conversations. I did have a question when I asked you about Rob getting invited to parties. I'm sure you've been invited to some some really good parties. Some ball terrors. Yeah, it's um, Christmas parties and what. Christmas or- parties. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, in in the. Um, in in the entertainment well i mean any sort of corporate function <clears throat> serves a purpose it serves a purpose for the brand that is putting it on to yep. expose themselves 
to invite future clients or whatever else, and 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 a, and a mingling and a you know conversations can be had and relationships can yeah, be built. Networking and yeah, yeah networking exactly. Um, but also, if you're if you have a job that's in the public uh, sphere or you know in public arena, then you might go to those functions so you get seen, you get your photo on the red carpet, and yep. then that might get posted, and that sort of helps your brand or keeps you relevant. So. Yeah, you can go to a party to go or a movie premiere or, or to a party to go and, you know, to go and have a drink and have a good time. But usually you're going to an event to, you know, the smart people go, they get their photo taken on the red carpet, you stay, have one drink, say hello to you, who you need to and yep. then piss off. Because it's the blokes who are getting sloshed and, you know, the last man standing at all these parties, they're the guys that aren't getting up at six o'clock and working, you know. So, yeah, yeah. so all It'd these be parties... an easy trap to get into. Yeah, wouldn't completely. It like, oh, I made it, I'm on the red A hundred percent, hundred percent. I'm drinking, i got yeah. free drinks and there's sexy girls and there's bloody free drugs or... Oh, well, not all parties have that, you know. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, it, you, you can fall into a, to a trap of, of are you there for the party or are you there to press the flesh and 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 um, be seen get your photo taken and then leave yeah, and that's yeah. what you got to really do you know I mean you, you you use that to your advantage and and sometimes you know as you guys know you build relationships and you know you might bloody run into a bloke at the news agent and you you make a work connection there whereas auditioning for something you might not like you know you, yeah. you'd build these relationships with those sort of places but yeah no i've been to um been to a, a couple of bloody corkers i suppose does yeah, it yeah. get messy uh well it's also a work thing so you don't want to be getting messy you know you save your messy parties for your mates and for closed doors and no cameras and if you want to get you know so a, even at that in that genre yeah. of party they still understand that it's work yeah, absolutely. Well, you're an idiot if you if you act like a you know. I mean, I've I've known people that 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 go to those parties and get really pissed and make dickheads of themselves, and six months later they're not working, you know, because they've said something to the wrong person or they've rep- If you're working for a TV network, you are representing that brand or yes. you're representing that show, whatever you're working on. And there's a there's a code of conduct and a special you know a, a element of professionalism that you have to yeah, yeah. conduct yourself in that way because you're on show and you're not you know Axel Whitehead you know with the mates down playing. So you wouldn't want to get your dick out <laughs> <laughs> the whole time. I didn't want to say it. I didn't want to say it. Well, I thought that'd be funny, but <laughs> yeah, it, I, I still think you're yeah, mate. <laughs> so yeah, I guess, uh, have you have you went for a job back with them? Are they no, I haven't had a phone haven't call back. Right. I think uh, no, I'll um, I'm gonna maybe pitch well. Oh, that was 10 years. What was that? 2008, 2000, 2004, 5, 6. Yeah, that was over 10 years ago. Are you still single? No. No. No, 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 no. no, no so no. Farmer, Farmer's Got a Wife is out. <laughs> yeah, no, that's out. Uh, yeah. Totally, totally. Um, but, uh, hey, but, but back to, um, sorry, back to USA. I've got a bunch of questions. Hit me. Um, um, so, so, so something like a weight cut. Like, um, so Rob used to be at one seventy. He's at one. He's at one eighty five now. He used to be at one seventy, right? That and what's what's he kind of what weight is he is he just walking around normally at? Rob, Rob will walk Pounds. around. So depending on what, like, say for example, straight after a fight. Yep. Like two weeks, three weeks after a fight. Yep. He'll get close to hundred kilos lean. He's still lean. What's what? What's that in pounds? Yeah. Uh, well, what's 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 sorry? What's 185? Pounds. What's an, oh, what's 185 in, 80, kil- in 85 kilos? 85 kilos, 84.5 kilos. Gotcha. And he'll get up to 110. You said 100. 100. Wow. He gotcha. could get to 110 easy. Easy. When he when he was a welterweight, the last weight cut he he was walking <laughs> around before that at 106 kilos. Jesus Christ! That's and a, just looked like a big dude. He wasn't fat. No, that's a big cut. Yeah, it's it's stupid. He couldn't do it. And that Fuck. we just started working together, and then when he had to go to to um when he went to middleweight yeah like he cut from lighter than what he walked away walked around at at welterweight because when you cut weight people don't understand this like there's shit that you would never eat yep but you walk past donut king and you just like if i said to you now like you can't eat Maccas ever again and you can't eat you probably would walk past Maccas now and not eat it yeah 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 but the, as soon as you say you can't have it and yeah. you're craving it I mean yeah, yeah. 100% so Oof. so he, he he walks around now now right now we're about three two and a half three weeks out and he's waking up at 90 between 92 and 94 kilos depending fluctuates wow he's yeah. gonna get to 90, uh, 85 yeah, easy cut but not yeah. easy not easy but doable right so can you explain a weight cut I mean my, my limited knowledge is water loading 
Yeah. Is it? And so you're smashing, smashing water as much as you possibly can. Uh, there's, and, and uh, there's a certain amount of water. Right. Can you drinks? explain that to me? Um, How to cut weight safely? Well, and safely and aggressive or whatever. Yeah. yeah. The, I don't. I don't. I won't <coughs> go into specific numbers. Yep. For two reasons. One, I don't want people to hear that and think that that's what they should do. Sure. Because there's a lot of factors involved with Rob. We know everything about him, and yep. we have all his spreadsheets. Gotcha. All his water. Yeah. So. First of all, you got to be fit the whole year round, yeah, and right. you got to be lean, because then what you want to do is the closer that it gets to the fight, you're just taking the water out of your body, gotcha, and then putting it back in, gotcha. You don't want to be burning calories, you don't want to no. be doing any of that. Um, the water just allows like one the release of a hormone that makes you go to the bathroom a lot more, mm-hmm. and uh, it just keeps you hydrated and keeps you like regular going to the bathroom, going that. So that's he starts his water loading probably a week out or so depending right but he's always very hydrated mm-hmm. you know and then the food start to get very 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 clean so sorry with water loading how much water is he drinking at that point how many liters a day He'll probably drink to about eight liters a day Jesus there, thereabouts Christ. yeah Fuck, that's 20 pisses a day or something oh Just more more really? more jesus yeah Sometimes some it, it might be a little bit more. He might start a little bit. That'll like, be the that'll be the max. Eight yeah, liters. eight liters would be about the max. Yeah, right. Okay. You know, and then he'll start to manipulate that, and he'll start to drop taper off. Yeah, no, he'll start to drop the weight though because it's funny, eh? Like we have like the, all the spreadsheets, and so you know exactly how much he's going to weigh on a certain day. How much if he eats A, B, C, and D, this is how much he's going to weigh. And that's and, and and that equation is 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 bang on. Fucking like. Is that right? Spot on. Yeah, but it's not because we're particularly clever. It's just because we've done it so much. And that's why it's I'm kind of hesitant <clears throat> when I speak about it. And I know like people like, I don't want some kid to go and do it. Yeah, 100%, man. There's going to there's gonna be someone out there listening going, I've got the secret now. Yeah. And that works for Rob. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, but it's not. It's very so, specific. Yeah, we, we got, we got three stuff. other dudes that are the same weight and everything, and their weight cut's different. Yeah, wow. Their body's different. They're gotcha. the same weight. They're fighting the same weight division. Right. And like thing like when when Izzy yeah. when he fights another guy from our gym he he doesn't even do he doesn't even have to cut he walks around the same size as Rob but I don't know why I'm not like I'm not like a sports scientist per mm-hmm. se but when he get he by the time he's ready to go on he just looks like uh, he's going to IFBB pro you know really? what I mean? but he doesn't actually restrict himself a lot Wow. It's just a different different body. I, I don't know. I don't know yep. exactly what it is. Yeah, right. You know, but we the thing that we do know is <clears throat> the results and we keep the records of what everyone does. So he does the, the water loading. He'll manipulate his diet 24 hours out from the weigh He cuts out the water and cuts out the food. Right. And then the day, the morning of the weight cut, he'll just get up. To, uh, look, we, we keep our training program throughout, mm-hmm. but it's manipulated to be a lot less yeah than what safe we do. And, yep, yeah yeah and then the so morning this, this, this is a, sorry this is a week out week out before the weigh yeah yep yep and so yep. the morning of the weight cut right of, of the weigh cut not of the weight day one yeah yep. no no the morning of the of weigh the weigh in of the weigh in yes right. i'm sorry yeah yep. the morning of the weigh in he'll get up and he'll be about 89 kilos jesus you know to get down to 84 and robert 89 kilos is like not a happy chappy He's okay. We can still, we'll get up in the morning and we'll play a game. Like I might play ping pong with him. We might play a game of soccer. So he's still got enough pep in his step to, to do that. And so that gets his, that makes him start sweating and make him start losing and also raises his uh, metabolic rate right. for the rest of the day. What time is, is the weight cut usually at the end of the day? Or yeah, in the it, evening. Is it really? And then you're fighting the next day. Yeah, sorry, can we go? Yeah, so, so then... He'll go do whatever he has to do. Or he'll go lie down. Depends on what the UFC has. This is the fucked up thing. Oh, In between that, you got media shit. Shit loads of media. Dude, and they're asking him stuff. Oh. And I was watching him last time with Romero. And Romero's like this, like... <laughs> like that. And, <laughs> and, and the worst part for Romero is somebody will ask him something. And it has to go in Spanish to his translator, oh, and then to think to him, and then he goes back, back. And I, I was looking at Romero, and I was like, I feel so sorry for you, dude. Oh, and Rob is walking around the same. The only thing is, he doesn't have the translator. And people think he's not a big guy, but he, he's a big guy. Like Tyson and him were here yesterday. Rob's a big dude. Yeah. But I think a lot of people haven't um, 
been around like island, islanders and that. Yep. If you didn't grow up maybe in Southwest Sydney or somewhere where there are a lot of islanders, mm-hmm. like if you did or you played football or something and like you played against a guy that doesn't look that big but he's an islander mm. and you go, how heavy are you? And he goes, 100 kilos. You believe him. Yeah, yeah. You never go, oh, no, yeah. I don't think you are. You know, yeah, you yeah, go, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, you are. You <laughs> yeah, and, right. and Rob, I don't know how people think he's a small guy. Yeah. I really don't. Yeah. So the morning of, he gets up. So we manipulated the water and right. the food. So the morning of, the way the way in, yep. he gets up at eighty nine, and that's when the weight cut actually begins. Wow! The rest he hasn't he he ate the night before. Yeah, right. Like he ate twenty four hours before the weigh in. So we go weigh ins at six o'clock. Mm-hmm. The last meal finished at mm-hmm. six p.m. the night before, and he has like a proper meal. So he's fully he's got like his glycogen in his muscles. He's got his functions in his brain. He's good. He mm-hmm. hasn't he's restricted his calories, but mm-hmm. not. We know how much he has to eat Mm -hmm. to reach the levels that he's not glycogen depleted and all of that. Mm -hmm. So then when he gets up, he's 89.5. He goes, we do the workout, raises the metabolic rate, stays throughout the whole day. And then we go, by by that stage, we go to the sauna. But now we might jump in the spa a little bit, jump in the sauna, jump in the spa, jump in the sauna, um, try and keep a relaxed talk, whatever. And I'm always like watching him. We've got the other coaches in there with him. We know how much weight he has to lose safely before anything. It never gets to that point anymore. It right. never gets, you know, the stuff you see where the guys are like, oh. Yeah. yeah but yeah. but when he was, he used to do seven kilos day of. <laughs> yeah, right. So that lose his hearing. <sighs> I never. I was never there for that. Really? I was never there for that. I, I didn't, oh, I didn't. Wrong. Yeah. And I'm not criticizing the coaches at the time because. No, no, sure. Because, you know, like. They would have got that and they would have been like, what do you want me to do? Do you mm. want us to call the fight or not or whatever? So um, I'm not criticizing them, but I never dealt with that seven kilos day of. But he did seven kilos day of. And what people don't understand, it's not like, it'd be hard for you or I, even if we're fit to lose seven kilos. And we got a lot more than seven kilos to lose. But this is a dude that's already going in there dry. Already going, yeah, just on death's door. Well, so what what happens to the body? What kind of shuts down at that? I mean, kidneys. Yeah, right. You know, kidneys like first one, hearing, eyesight, and is that and that's a, and you say so your your kidneys are just fucking wrecked. Yeah, there's that. If you do it like that, but yeah, gotcha. we don't do it like that no more. Yeah, yeah. not even close. In, in, in sort of in not less professional, but in smaller organisations and more sort of amateur stuff, there's and you don't have the the wealth of experience around you. People must still be cutting weight in a pretty dangerous way, huh? People are still cutting weight in a dangerous way in the UFC. Really? Yeah. Like we see dudes sometimes we're at the back with them. Oh, just and, holding them up. And there's guys that, well, they don't make weight. Yeah. They there's don't, guys yeah. 100% don't make weight. Yeah. But there's guys that don't make weight and they look like they're going to die. Or yeah. there's guys that make weight, which is probably worse. There's guys that make weight and they look like they're going to die. There's no more water in the brain and then they're going to go out and fight. And they're going to get hit in the head. Um, and that's the reason that the UFC now have the weigh-ins separate to the the weigh-ins where they invite everyone in, yeah? I don't know, man. Oh, because that's done the private room, isn't it? And yeah, then they, well, they do the public one. I think they used to do it. Yeah, they used to do it all together in that public. Ah, gotcha. Yeah. Public but, arena and everyone. Yeah, but, yeah right. No, that's man, right. like, I, 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 I don't know. Like, I can't. I've I got my own yeah. opinions, but, <laughs> like... You still see, and, and the problem is, man, there's no way to eradicate that. I, I don't think, like, the only, because people say, well, it doesn't happen in whatever. Da, da. The problem is, what happens is you put in X amount of money, and I'm not, and I say, we're still going to have to come up with some way or another that we're going to weigh the same mm. when we fight. Because mm. I'm not going to let you be five kilos heavier. No. So if we say you've got to weigh in just before you get on the in the octagon, what happens if you don't make weight then? Yeah. Do we just do we just call off the show that yeah. cost I don't know, ten million dollars to put together? I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. No worries. Yeah. yeah, so we were at the weight cut. Yeah. So like eighty nine and a half day of we play some games, do some little bit of workout, and then it gets gets down to that final. Yeah, yeah. it gets down in the last couple of hours, he'll lose maybe one or two kilos. Right. And then it's done. Yeah. And then how fast is the recovery after that weight cut? You've got 20, I mean, not even 20. He walks hours. into the cage at 93 kilos. Jesus. Yeah. From 84? 
Yeah. No not- IVs, nothing. Really? Yeah, he's got an eating program he has to follow on that. What what he what what's a fighter eating after the weigh in? Is it just get as much in as possible? No, or? no, no. no. So he, he he'll start to like he'll he's he's got a full eating and drinking program. Yep. So it'll start off with just starting to replenish fluids. Mm-hmm. So he'll drink some hydrolyte, some water, and he's got X amount that he's got to drink. Right, gotcha. Oops. You know. And then he'll have something, some like small fruit salad, mm-hmm. um, oh, relatively small, you know. Mm. And he wants to eat, like as you can imagine. Mm, mm. But your your stomach's shrunk, and it's not. You, you have to you have to eat properly. Yeah. And then it'll start to be. See what happens in the last week, week and a half. The diet changes, so he's calorie calorie restricted mm. in as far and because we want him. No, not even you're just calorie restricted. Like there's certain things that he won't eat because when after the weigh-in, you can't have like spicy foods and da 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 da. Right. Although you want to. Yeah, right. You want to have like, for me, if I ever cut weight, I always want to have curries. Yeah, right. You know, because you, you haven't eaten a lot of stuff. Yeah. As no. much as people can go, no, that you can because you can make it tasty like this. You can to a certain degree, dude. But right. You're cutting down. You're a hundred kilo guy getting down to eighty four and a half. You're not, right. you're not eating, but yep, yep, yep. But so we try and make sure that the, what he ate in the last week <clears throat> is what he's going to eat post weighing. Okay, but right. So it's not that, a massive shock to the body. Yeah, yeah. You can't, and then he's got portion sizes that he's got to eat. So basically, eating small meals for the next bunch of hours. Like he's got everything written down. I'd, gotcha. have, I'd have to get it up and. And then, eat. and how does he find himself in the condition? Hey, do you feel like you're back to a hundred percent, or you're getting back to? 80 percent or it's 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 how he does it yeah is fine is that right yeah so he feels he's bang on ready to go yeah yep. yeah yeah yep. but there's been other times where he hasn't yeah not right. not since we all not since the whole thing's gelled <clears throat> excuse me but prior to that when he was still learning how to do all of that mm. it's not the weight cut that's hard it's i think my opinion is the rehydration and the getting the food the right food in the right way back into your body really yeah because the weight cut, you can make the weight. Mm. It's not incredibly hard, provided you somewhat hydrate, etc. And it's not stupid weight that you're trying to get to. Can you get back to being able to fight at 100%? Completely. That's yeah. the hardest thing. Yeah, right. Wow. It's not. Wow. And because you see, you know, you hear of fighters that have gone through a really hardcore cut and they find that what they... <laughs> Mark Hunt and the, oh, fuck, and the chocolate there. milk. I was there, yeah. yeah. 100%. <laughs> And so, and what, and they, they just feel they get hit a couple of times. Go, oh fuck, this hurts, or this, it, it, it just knocks them. Around. They don't have that strength. They don't have. You, you don't have. If you have a bad weight cut, you and you can't get the glyc, like oh, yeah, the glycogen yeah, right. back in your muscles. Gotcha. Like you got no, nothing. Nothing. Zero. Fuck. Yeah, and and then you have no water in your brain. Yeah, and then your fucking will goes, and then oh. imagine, imagine like um, you have a big night out. Yep. Just try and imagine you're having a big night out. Yep. I don't know if we can. Easy. <laughs> so you have a big night out, and then you're gonna run 10 k's the next day, Ugh. right? But not only that. Every now and then, without us telling you, yep. Eli is just gonna follow you around, and hit you with a trolley pole. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> at, at random times. Finally, <laughs> the worst. You know, and you have to run the 10 k's. Yeah. Like at a certain pace. Oh. You know, and if you stop running, then he can go to town on you with a trolley pole. Wow. You know, until I pull, I'll take him off here. <laughs> Completely. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what it'd be like. So do you, like, I mean, the mindset of a fighter, um, I mean, you, from, from, a, from, a, from, a, uh, from a spectator's stance and from the limited time I've spent in gyms and, and seen or spoken to a professional, they seem like such sweet lovely people generous and calm and and not bloodthirsty kind of guys maybe because when you get to that point that you realize that you can handle anyone in any situation that no one's really a threat and they they're really lovely intelligent people uh but how that that fighter's instinct or that killer instinct is that can that can that be worked on or is are you born with that is that kind of at at what level though well, I mean, I don't know. You, you, you look at you look at a you look at Anderson Silva or someone, and he's lovely and calm and that sort of stuff. Oh, but he doesn't look like an aggressive guy. I mean, he's t- he's 
technique and, and, and everything. I mean, he's on another level, I, I see. But you, you, know, you, you see guys that have just got that fucking mongrel in them and they want it, they want it, they want blood. Or you've got those blokes where, I mean, Rob, to, to chat to her, you see his demeanor, it looks sweet as, sweet as buggery. But when he's in there, you know, he's a killer. So I, I think, I think like, do you have to be born, born with that? I, I, suppose, I think you have to be born with everything to a certain degree. Right. You know what I mean? Like, say, for example, had I have just wanted to keep playing the guitar and like deep down in my fucking heart of hearts, but I'm two thirds <laughs> retired for music, you know what I mean? So um, maybe I would have got to a point where I could do a few songs yeah. and maybe I could maybe, maybe have, uh, I don't know, maybe have a little band or something yep, that does yep. gigs that yep. people don't know. Fuck, they're really, really drunk. Yeah. You know? <laughs> But but then but then like I'm not you. Yeah. Then you got yeah. You the got difference to be born between you it. and I is fucking retarded. Yeah. In, in music. In music. Yeah. 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 And so, like yeah, and I, I don't know. Like it's like me saying, does Eli maybe have natural music talent, but he didn't pursue it. Yeah. But yeah. and thing, but like someone like Rob, and this people don't get that. People go, no, I don't. I don't agree. And then I think, well, then you don't know. Yeah. So just say you don't know. Yeah. Yeah. You know yeah, what yeah, I mean? Because completely. like the difference between him. Like those top guys, yeah. Like it's totally different, dude. It's not like they're not like they're not they're not people that um are, they're not normal in that sense. In the same way that how if you hear music, mm. you you hear music. Mm. I don't hear that. Mm. I just mm. hear mm. Bah, 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 sure. in the background, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and yeah. then like if I see, you know, you ask me about dancing. I don't. I can't hear the beat. So I will watch people in a time. How they move. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, that's awesome. true. I'm not, I'm not yeah. joking. But you're probably watching the guy who can't dance. <laughs> that's that's like, no, no, no. I, I know. Like, I'm not that guy that does like yeah. this. I'm not. I just, yeah. I, don't, I don't even go. I don't even try and dance. Yeah. But that that's my point. Like, he, no, they're not. The, it, Rob isn't like a dude that, oh, he's just like a normal guy. And mm. as nice and as sweet as they are, they, they, they are savages. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, they yeah. are there to... Yeah. To more. Like, they're going to they're gonna switch, Big you know? Time. But Big but time. at the same time, it's like... Uh, they're, they're, edu- they're not, they're not, no, like they're not savages in the term yeah. of... Completely. Amoral monsters. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not psychopaths. Yeah, but, but they're definitely they're not built street. the same way. Yeah. They're not built the same way. And, right. Um, the, the, the other thing is when you have Anderson Silva, Rob, Chris Weidman, Rockhold, Romero... Those upper upper echelon guys, they're guys that have the mindset, mm-hmm. have the skill set, the physique, mm-hmm. everything to be able to go. Because like, you know, you could be, you know, out of musician, if you were like a 7 out of 10 musician, but an 11 out of 10 good looks, somebody will pick you up. They'll pick you up. Yep, yep. But if you like 10 out of 10 looks, 10 out of 10 musician, 10 out of 10 as far as like knowing what to do in the business... Mm. You're gonna go. No brainer. Yeah. Yeah, you're gonna yeah. go. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, those guys are kind of get it, and they've got the whole package, you know. And they're not they they know what they're doing. Gotcha. And another thing with like the jacket is the 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 rock holds the all those guys. There's no quit in them. Like, yeah. There's like Bispings, all of those dudes. Like you need to hit them with like a bat and put them out. Like there's no. And this is the other thing people don't get. Like I look at a guy like Jacket when he fought Rob. And that this isn't to say, and I mean no disrespect him, this isn't to say if he has to fight Jacare again, which he might, yep. like he has to fight Romero again, that we'd be any less <clears> nervous. <throat> mm-hmm. But there was a point in that fight where I knew that Jacare was not going to win it. Yeah, wow. All right? What was it? You could see? He just copped too much damage. At, and, and the yep. way that... Hey, let me look at you. Pass me a water. Like he just copped too much damage at, at that point. Like yeah, right. It's just that just... He he just got too much damage at, at that point of the of the fight mm. and the way that the fight yeah. had played out. Thank you. Eli. He he just copped too much. Yeah. And Rob was already in his game and he was dictating the pace and controlling the octagon and cutting him off and it wasn't it just wasn't gonna happen for yeah. him. Yeah, wow. And he'd he'd already copped the first head kick. So he copped a big head kick. 
don't know if you saw the fight. Yeah, I can't, I can't remember in detail, to be honest, but I did watch the Dude, fight. Dude, he took this head kick. Looked like he got hit with a baseball bat. Fuck. And um, he got up. Like, I don't know, it didn't drop him, but it just got him, like, solid. Mm-hmm. And it was done. And really? there was no, like, not 0% where yep. he was checked out. Where you see other dudes, they, they kind of check out. And they might go the five rounds, but they kind of check out. Right. Guys like that as well, Jacare, there's no checking out. Like, you saw his fight with Gastelum. Like, something, how he was, I don't know what happened. They're both good mm. fighters, but they're both getting hurt. There's no, no point was there a check out. No, 100%. And um, those dudes have that. And then to have, but you can have that inside you. But if you're not fit, which means you're not disciplined, so you're not fit, then that time to check out will come quicker than you thought gotcha that's interesting yeah. you know like yeah. if you haven't slept yeah then there's going to be a point where completely. the notes don't yep come out completely you need to sleep yeah you know? yeah so if you're not fit because you didn't have the discipline in that you're going to be found out yeah and right. there's a guy like one of those killers waiting to completely to do it. Yeah. and they have like in the fight there's no there's no empathy they they going to try and really hurt you really yep. name you it's yep. not a game no 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 jesus um and uh sorry i probably now got to wrap wrap it up no no uh, just go hard um uh so obviously there's a lot of study on on your opponent watching watching everything looking for weaknesses um and and, and emulating emulating uh, bringing other tra- bring other training partners in or sparring partners to emulate that sort of stuff or or I don't want to give you obviously give no. any secrets. No, I'm that, just so. trying to think. Uh, get going. Yeah, um, it, that that's obviously a, a massive part of of the camp and leading up to it. When when you know who who's what. I mean, for for someone like Romero, what you just a lot of lot of groundwork, a lot of bloody. You got to be careful. There's there's like a happy medium. You got to be careful not to fall into the trap of you doing what he's going to do. Gotcha. Because you, you're sort of. Um, proliferating a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, gotcha. You know, so... And when that doesn't happen, that shocks the fuck out of you, I suppose. Yeah, too. well, we got to impose... Rob has to impose yes. his game on Romero. Yep, and Romero like has to worry about Rob imposing his game. Gotcha. So if Romero goes home and goes... And, and this is the concept that Romero can't knock Rob out and Rob can't outgrapple Romero, which mm. isn't true. Mm-hmm. Either one of these things could happen. Yep. Very likely to happen either way. Um, so Romero is going to impose his game on Rob. Yep. Rob's going to impose his game on Romero. Right. We are aware of tendencies and um, idiosyncrasies in Romero's game. Yep. We are aware of idiosyncrasies and tendencies in Rob's game. Yep. And then it's who's going to get off first. Yep. And who's going to put the pressure on. Gotcha. Who's going to control the space. Yep. It's the same any sport, whether it's football or whatever. Yep. You're just controlling space. Yep. Whether you're doing it with a ball or... Right. Thing. So who's going to control the space? Who's going to dictate the pace of the fight? Mm-hmm. Who's going to start inflicting damage? Mm-hmm. Is that going to be exponential? Are we going to be able to do that for the whole fight until one of them gotcha. can't do it anymore? Yeah, right. And uh, <clears throat> it's not... <laughs> You know, I was thinking, you know, we were talking before about people writing stuff on YouTube. Mm. Like, uh, and I don't read it because, thing, but sometimes I do, you know, I can't yeah. help it. <laughs> yeah. And it was for the last Romero fight and they embedded. They were filming us playing a game right. before Romero's ah, fight. Yeah. Yeah. And this guy writes, these fucking idiots, instead of playing this game of soccer, they should be working on Romero's... Um, on, on Rob's skill sets for Romero. <laughs> and I'm thinking, do you really do that? That's all we do. We just play some games. Yeah, we'll rock up and see what happens. And they interviewed, they interviewed me, actually, and they said, well, you know, the same shit. Who do you think will win and da-da-da? And I said something along the lines of, like... And I'll say it again. Like, who do you think is going to win? I don't know who's going to win. Yeah. Does Rob have the skill set to beat Romero? He does. Mm-hmm. Does he have the preparation to beat Romero? Absolutely. Mm. Does Romero look like a pussy? Like, do you know what I mean? Does he look like you go, oh, that's a short... Man, Romero has a skill set that he could beat Rob too. Yep. Absolutely he could, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, we've done everything he, we could do. Rob's done everything he could do. And um, Romero is who Romero is. Now they've got to fight. And whoever gets off first and puts their, their strategies and their tactics in play is going to win. Completely. How bad was Rob's knee in that first round with that leg kick? Like, 
Fucking it, it, it wasn't torn to shreds. And you really? know what? Romero does that in all his fights. And we drilled that. <clears throat> this is people's... Again, now people tell us... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Experts. You looked out for that kid. Yeah, you know, uh, blah, 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 blah. And he does that in all his fights. And yeah. we drilled that. Yeah. And like, he landed that kick twice on Rob. And then for 25 minutes, didn't land it again. Nah. And again, people go... And I hear like commentators and they say, oh, I don't know how Romero's corner is not telling him to stomp his leg. And I think like, you know how, like, it's hard to do that with a dude you've already hit yeah. with fast hands that's going, you, I'm going to punch you in the face next time you do that. Yeah. It's not easy. No, no. And Romero said it himself. He's like, I was trying, believe me, I was trying to maim him, mm. but um, he was defending it. He's yeah. not a moron. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So it was bad. It was bad. It wasn't bad where, where, where he wasn't going to be able to fight, but it was bad. Yeah, right. Yeah. It um, took a lot for Rob to keep himself like that. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, Reebok sponsorship. Um, unless you're sort of top two or three or four or whatever else, um, if Re- Reebok hadn't come in, how much money... Um, probably not not the top five blokes, but fighters. What what's the pay cut? I mean, I, I don't I don't know. But Re- Reebok don't look like they pay. I mean, for for a number ten, five or ten grand a fight. I don't know what the figures are. But uh, what's the difference in sponsorship between your Reebok money and what you could get via independent sponsorship? I think a lot. Really? It's yeah. Fucking. It's a it's a rot. They've fucked a lot of fighters with that. Yeah, a lot. Like say for example. I don't know you 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 have this Ducati deal yeah yeah I got a yeah okay. if Ducati. you were a fighter and you could you you, you got like a you, you, they, they give you a motorbike I don't know do you want to yeah yeah oh yeah I'm, I'm a yeah, Ducati ambassador and I get to borrow bikes so I walk in there and and social media and uh, do events and that sort of stuff but yeah I, I have a relationship with Ducati where I can go and borrow motorbikes from them for as long as I want or as long as they can give them to me. All right, Rob just had something like that with Mercedes, for instance. <coughs> wow, awesome. All right, so... And that's without him being able... Like, the time that they're going to look at him is when he's in those 25 minutes in the octagon. Yep. So if he could have Mercedes on his shorts... Yep. Or Ducati... Completely. Like, and if they're willing to give him a car without him being able to do that, and Mercedes has money yep. <laughs> do you know what I mean so that's just, just to Jesus. give you an idea yeah, wow. and Reebok Jesus Christ that Reebok brutal. is not giving Rob I don't want to talk about Rob's finances no, not my no. place but yep. but yeah just factor that in fucking hell you know so yeah right so why why was it I mean obviously to get a monopoly on the sport it's such a shame that fighters had to you know had to take such a fucking massive cut a massive pay cut with that but do you think it was to obviously A to for business deals but to clean up the sport do you think now it i mean when it first happened it looked fu- as a spectator it looked fucking stupid those outfits were fucked it was like what is going on and then me and some mates were discussing it and it seemed like they were trying to maybe clean it up or if, if you know make it more less rough or or or, or, or you know try, trying to trying to make it more palatable to public like to the public or I, I, do you I, think it's just a complete i mean it's just a Purely, open. I don't know. Like it's, it's. Um, I, I don't know if you like. I, I think that at the end of the day, though, the from a business perspective, not from the fighters' health. Yeah. But from a business perspective, the UFC owners they're the ones taking the financial yeah, 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 risk. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so there's, no, there, there's no goodwill. Or there's no. Yeah, and and they got to make money too. Because if they didn't make money, then there's no promotion. Yep. Um, <clears throat> It's a hard one, man, because like that's a. I think that that's like a a, a whole discussion as well. Yeah, right. Wow. And yeah, and yeah, sometimes yeah. I think it's better. Because I can have my opinion, but I'm then associated to Rob, and it isn't fair for me. Yep. Yeah, that's fair. That, like I, that's I don't fair. know if that, if that yep. makes sense. No, hundred percent, mate. Because yeah. then it's yeah. Rob's because Rob's on this podcast. Yeah, yeah, kind yeah. Of thing, yeah so. You're talking on behalf of it. No, cool. Um, uh, uh, priced. Uh, how much a fire can earn in the UFC as opposed to Bellator, or what's the, what's the the money making or the your uh, revenue streams? The, the UFC is the biggest payday days for, at, at this moment. Yeah, is there a massive difference between Bellator and UFC? I think someone like Rob, like let's say for example, were he to be able to go, I'm going to leave the UFC, which th- wouldn't happen. No. He's on a contract, etc. Yep. Da da da. But let's say like take that out. Yep. I'm sure Bellator would bid 
big money for someone like Rob. Yeah, gotcha. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, there'd probably be organizations in Japan that would get him to fight a panda for, yeah, sure. for a lot of money. Gotcha, you know? 100%. <laughs> um, but if you're up and coming, it's very hard. Yeah. We got another guy now, Jacob, that you were talking to a few different people about him <clears> fighting. But uh, he, he'll probably fight he'll probably do something where he can still box because he fights professionally as a boxer as well. Right. But no, the UFC is out and out yeah. going to pay more money. Yep. That's 100%. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. It's so it's hard. It's a hard, it's a hard, fuck, it's a hard way to make a living. living isn't it? You know? I mean, what Mark was saying um, on your podcast, like 95% of the blokes won't make it. I mean, it's like the acting game as well. 100%. You know, there's not many that make it, you know, and you can get a few little roles and you might get a few guesties and, you know, be on a show here and there. Some people, you know, steam on through and respect to them, you know. I've got mates who have rocked up and just gone to job, to job, to job, to job, to job. But other blokes might take them 15 years, 20 years, you know, until they... And some won't make it. Well, some won't it's make it. It's as simple as that. 100%. You know, and, and with the with the fighting, it's hard. <clears throat> I see a lot of the fighters as well when we go away. Like, they live like they're rock stars, you know? And Is that right? Man, and I, sometimes I look at them and I think, dude, rock stars don't live like they're rock stars. You know what I mean? <laughs> totally. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's totally. And some of these guys, illusion. man, like, I'm looking at them and I think, like, you're on... 25 to show 25 to win and I can't help just the way my mind works and I do the maths on how much this guy earns gotcha and the guy's carrying on like like you know they, they ca- some of them carry on like they're superstars and they're rock stars and I think dude you're on like less money than than a primary school teacher or a nurse 100%. and they are much more important than you you know what I mean <laughs> yeah. like you're and you're on less money than them and you're carrying on like yeah right you know and they it's kind of toxic as well because and then you, you would probably relate to this Look, there's a small bubble and some people know who you know mm-hmm. know who you are mm-hmm. but the drop off is fucking immense yeah. and if you can't handle the fact that um, some people don't know who you are mm-hmm. you know what mm-hmm. I mean mm-hmm. and and I watch the way they act yeah wow and they're not <laughs> on enough money to you shouldn't act like a dickhead regardless but you're not on enough money to even warrant your ego getting away from you completely you know and there's a lot of them yeah it's fascinating uh when i used to um host video hits we would sort of fly around the world and interview a bunch of bands and all the pop stars and rah rah rah, and it was the blokes at the top that were really lovely people really humble and would sit and talk and just so approachable it was the blokes on the way up that had the chips on their shoulders or you know would would sort of be have you know an incorrect perspective on themselves or they'd have tickets on themselves you know it, it's 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 those blokes that um you know maybe have gone through that struggle and and spent the time that it creates humility and they've fucking worked for what they've got but it's either the blokes that got it too quick or on the way up uh, the blokes that you know that are acting like fuckwits and it seems that that's probably you know yeah i'd, I'd say that's across <coughs> a lot of industries without a doubt if you, if you yeah. took some shots in whatever you're doing um, I was just, I'm not gonna, like, I was just yeah. laughing because, like, sometimes you, you talk to people and <clears throat> you hear them and then you, you realize, like, you know, like, what they're saying, and they're young, they're young, mm. and they're young up here too. Mm. They might be not much younger than me, but yeah. they're young up here. Yep. And then um, you just, you just see that they got no idea, no anything about what, what, what they're talking about. Yeah. But, then when you couple that with a little bit of su- success, quote unquote, whatever success is, you couple that with that, like it's arrogant. Completely. It's thing, and, and people will give you a little bit of time a day if you're on top. Yep. But man, it's when a you fucking come long down, way down and it's fucking quick, man. It takes a long time to get there, but God damn, it's easy to come down. I'll tell you that do, you, do you feel that that's a big thing? Like for you in particular with <laughs> oh, some of the drops you've had? Yeah, well, uh, what, meeting dickheads or, or, nah, or, or, like, or fall, uh, working hard and then falling off? Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. I mean, as we we're talking about with the Arias thing, that, that was from, you know, that was from being employed to nothing. Yeah. Um, have I had it before? I, I suppose struggling in LA. I mean, not that I've fucked up or had something and lost it, but I mean, going from being, you know, working in Australia and having a bit of a profile and you can sort of generate work to going to a new market where you're very small in a massive pond and having to completely start from scratch, you know, learning that steps and putting in that work, um, that teaches huge amount of, em- you know, empathy and, and, um, and humility and, and, and bloody character building when you've got to go and, you know, start again, basically, in a fucking way harder market, or not a harder market, but a way bigger market. 
Um, does the bigger market, and I'm curious about this, does the bigger market make it easier or harder? Because uh, there's more work, but more competition. Exactly, exactly. There's way more money, way more work, a lot more projects, but uh, the, the I mean, we've got incredible, um, I mean, if you're talking about acting, we've got incredible actors in Australia. Um, but over there, you've got the world's best and everyone around from the world is congregating. So yeah, it, it, it does get harder. The opportunities are, are far greater and the money's a hell of a lot more available. Um, but yeah, it is, it, is, it is bloody hard. But um, I suppose if you're Australian, I mean, also Australians have been popular for the last sort of 10 years as well, just with our, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know, 10, yeah, 10, 15 years, I suppose, just with, with the type of people we are and with our work ethic and how we approach things and how we treat people, that goes a really long way in Hollywood. And we have a fantastic reputation overseas for being no bullshit, for being, uh, you know, for being down to earth, for being well prepared, for uh, and and for being humble, and probably because it, it it takes a lot for us just to get there. Like, I mean, to get a visa, it's about ten thousand bucks, and you've got to go through a whole process, and you're packing up your life, you're moving away, you're moving to another country. I mean, that in itself, you don't get here and go, oh fuck it, I'm going to eat burgers and smoke weed. You know, sometimes you do do yeah. that when you're fucking lazy and um, need a kick in the ass. But but yeah, you know, if you're going to go there, you got to, and you're putting your eggs in this basket, you got to work fucking hard. And if you're there and you're committed and you've you know, and, and you're gonna gonna make those sacrifices, then you're gonna, you know, you got to make it happen. You, you don't go there to fuck around, you know. Um, but, um, uh, to, to change the subject again, um, quickly, Darren Till, yeah, exciting fighter, very good, very, very, good. very good against Wonder Boy. That's going to be an amazing fight. Yes, yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, I also think Darren Till's probably not going to stay at well to wait for long. You reckon? I think he'll probably go up to, to middleweight. He's a very good fighter. Very, yeah, very good. Yeah. Do you reckon he, do you reckon he can get Wonder Boy? He I, can. He's I don't got know a big he cut, will. though, wouldn't he? Because he, he's, he's a big boy. Who? Darren Till. He's Darren, a big boy for one Darren second. Darren Till's like. a big guy. Wonder Boy is not massive. No. Um, I think he can beat Wonder Boy. I don't know if he will. Yeah, I reckon he can. I reckon he's going to. Yeah. I, get money on that. I don't know. I He's going to try and, like, come like you know stalk him down and he has to yep he's gonna try and like stalk him down and Mm -hmm. put the heat on him but i don't know if he will be able to wonder boy's not dumb and Mm -hmm. he's a sniper and he's clever and he's good yeah and he's got a chin yeah he's not he's not a pussy yeah he's he's very good yeah what do you think Eli? be a good fight same thing that like you say they both got the skills to beat each other but i don't know it'd be a good fight to watch like said, I don't think he's just going to go in close. there and, and and feed him. I think like, yeah, yeah. He's going to try, and I, and I think like Wonder Boy can grapple as well. Like people don't think, yeah, you, you, people forget that. It's like they talk about Rob, and like, there's a bunch of other dudes. I'm sure Darren Till can grapple too. Yep. Do you know, so so you know, like I don't, I don't, I don't know because I don't like the. the Dudes can grapple too. Yeah. So I, I don't know. Maybe one of them takes the other one out of the element. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Do you know? And I, I think Wonder Boy has very underrated grappling. Yeah. He's beaten guys that um should have been able to just take him down. I never thought they were going to just take him down. But yeah, wow. do you know what I mean? That theoretically you should have been able to take him down and yep. just beat him up. Then there's been like no easy fights with Wonder Boy. No mm. one's had an easy fight with him. Yeah. Um. Darren Till, same deal, you know, like, interesting. I reckon, he's, I reckon he puts, I reckon Darren Till puts bloody Tyra and Woodley to sleep. He could, he could. But, um, man, those dudes, like, the thing is, a lot of these guys, and I'm sure Darren Till has it, mm-hmm. but a lot of those dudes, when you see that, like, their second and third phases of fighting are really, like, full on, like, it's like, other level stuff it's like yeah right they'll take a shot like like you see Thompson take a shot get dropped should be out you yeah know what I mean when you see him against Woodley takes a shot should be out is hurt and comes back completely do you know what I mean yeah. and that that level like that that's championship fighter you know that's a different level you see guys take like Edgar Edgar versus Maynard <coughs> When he got dropped like three times yeah. in the first round, <laughs> regathered, came back like 
it's it's a different type of, of fighter like that that would li- like they all those guys that you know they're not there by accident they no. didn't no. so I don't know I don't know um, I, I, I don't know I think Darren Till can beat anyone yeah if he on a good day I've rated him for a while now yeah. um, I don't know that um, it's gonna necessarily happen this time yeah but it definitely could yeah I, I can't pick one there DC and Stipe I think Stipe's a little too big. Like, Stipe's yeah. a big guy. He's a big guy, eh? I, th- yeah. I think so, and I think um, <clears throat> he's really tidy with his hands. Yep. Really, really tidy. Um, I think DC's got fast hands and good wrestling. I don't know that he can do it to Stipe for, for five rounds. Yeah. Um, Imagine if he ragdoll him. Who was he ragdolling? Gufferston and someone else. Yeah, he did it to what, Barnett. What, what weight are they fighting at? Heavy. Are they? Yeah, right. Yeah. Gotcha. He did it to Barnett, but Barnett is a different type of fighter to to yeah. Um Not they're not. He's not worse. He's just different type of fighter. Stipe moves really well for a big guy. Yeah, he's got really good hands, like really tidy boxing. Uh huh. Um, good. He's a good wrestler too. Mm-hmm. And I don't know that 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 DC will be able to... I think DC's got really fast hands, though, mm. that people don't really realise. Yeah. He's got really fast hands. Yep. So, I don't know. What do you reckon? Oh, just a tough fight again. Do you mean I think any of them, any fights that are yeah. for a title or in that top 10... <coughs> 100%, I think so, yeah, too. Yeah, you mean it can go either way. They're yep. there for a reason, like Fab said. Yeah. So, it could be, do you know what I mean? DC could, for five rounds, wrestle him and hold him up against the cage Yeah. And that dirty boxing. But Steve Bay could catch him on the way in. It's... I mean, like they said, Steve, he's got really good boxing. His hands are super good. Yeah. So could go either way. Because that they're guys that have had like, there's a big difference between you did some striking, da da da. But these like classically trained in boxing. Yeah. Wow. You know, so he gotcha. wrestled growing up, yep. and he's like re- boxed Golden Gloves in the US as an amateur. Wow. And that's, you, you, you know, you have a bunch of boxing fights. It's very different. It's very different. You can't go anywhere. You're, you're boxing. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Connor and Khabib. Again, like, I think Connor can catch him. I think. But, you know, Khabib. The problem is Khabib's, Khabib's style is hard to do if you can't, if you, if you start to slow down. Yeah. It's hard. <clears throat> Again, you don't have to be an expert. I think, like, Connor can catch him on the way in. He's yep. got Connor's got really good um, use of range. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, and Khabib's really good at taking that range away. Yeah. So can, is can, he going to get caught on the way in? How's how's his hands moving backwards though, Khabib? Do you reckon? Does he, does he move backwards? Much? He doesn't yeah, move backwards. He probably does. Yeah. <laughs> no, he doesn't. And if you step right. forward on him right. too much, he's going to take you down. Yeah. God, if he gets yeah, if Connor gets taken down, it's fucking lights out. Look, Connor's not oh, that man. bad on the ground. I just, yeah. I just think that Khabib's very good. And and the thing people don't understand is if you get taken down and beat up for a round, it's not the same. Like, but if somebody takes you, if you take someone down, and you don't do much with it, and they pop back up, yeah, ah, uh, the takedown is what takes the most of energy, probably in, in all of MMA. Right. That yep. double leg takedown. Gotcha. So, yeah. But yep. Khabib has never shown to be not able to take people down and just rinse, repeat. Yep, yep. Then can you get your punches off with him coming forward? Yeah. But they're not dumb. Like again, like Eli said, like like they know what they're doing. So it's just going to be a question of like Robin Romero, who's going to get there first? Mm-hmm. Who's going to implement their game? Mm-hmm. Who's going to control the space? Who's going to put their strategies and their tactics in place? without wearing damage without wearing too much damage and inflicting it upon the other fighter i know that's like anyone you could my mom could have told me that dickhead thank you thank you for wasting my time (laughs) but yeah but that's that's the truth of it though yeah yeah you know it's it's a it's a hard one i think um Connor's got good striking, you know. Is there any news on on that fight? Is there? Yeah, I don't even know if it's going to yeah, happen. Yeah, to be honest with you, I've heard something. Been talking a few other names and that. Really? But yeah, I'm not too sure. I haven't I haven't heard any news on it. Yeah, yeah, Kevin right. Lee's another dude that that's like of that that <clears throat> Khabib nature, you know that. Yeah. 
How's his ground game? I can't think of Ke- it. Kevin Lee's. Yeah. Very, very, yeah. very, very good. Yeah, right. Gotcha. Can't very, very good. Really good wrestler, yeah? Yeah, really yeah. good wrestler. Yeah. Very good grappler. Gotcha. Like, he, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of good guys mm. in, in those mm. divisions. And if they all match up, no one would stay undefeated yep. in that in that thing. Like, is t- is TJ and um, uh, Mighty Mouse, is that fight going to happen? No, I think I it's, think it's so. TJ and... And uh, Cody again, yeah, isn't Cody it? Cody Cabrant. Oh, that's right. It yeah, is yeah. So they're they're going around too. That's another that's good fight. Be great. Yeah, there's some. There, there's a lot of good fights coming up. Great isn't it? ones yeah. going up. Fuck. It's a big cards. Yeah. Just huge. That cards Chicago really. card's going to be big. That's yes. going to be great. Yeah, yeah gonna I'm going to try massive. and try and get there. I've got a bit of a crush on Holly Holm. There's something about her demeanor. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure you're the only one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you're the only one. <laughs> <laughs> no, man. Like. Uh, Man, we we got to wrap yeah, up. Yeah, definitely, man. Definitely. But, um, I can pepper you with questions. Keep on going, but we got to. Uh, oh, you can you tell more. us if you got some projects coming up or anything? Anyone you want to shout out? Yeah, uh, just uh, putting final touches on an EP. Um, so probably five or six songs on a little record that we're going to be releasing, hopefully towards the end of the year. The first single we played um, a little while ago, but um, yeah, uh, that'll <coughs> be happening in the end of the year. Um, just became an ambassador for Are You OK? The suicide prevention. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, we haven't sort of talked about a little bit much about that, but uh, really stoked to be an ambassador for that. So I get a few projects towards the end of the year, and working. On, Why is that? What made you do that? Uh, just because I mean I've had some up and downs, and I've had my mental health issues here and there, and um, also growing up in the country, there's a massive. Um, it's you know a bit of an epidemic of farmers yeah. committing suicide you know it's a, it's a really big thing um and also just for men you know for young men for for men around their sort of early 30s and um also younger um there's just a lot of conversations that aren't being had um and there's a lot of fellas in need and it's a funny time in the world for you know for men i believe um and for, for finding role models and for finding, you know, finding their way and um, and also to have, I mean, the great thing about Are You OK? One of the first things is asking Are You OK? Then you listen, then you encourage um, help and then you follow up. And, 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 and reaching out to mates and starting that conversation is fucking hard, you know? And I've had some really shit times in my life too, you know, where um, speaking to a mate or a family member is actually, you know, and being vulnerable and then finally when you're, start asking or you're being honest and then you just feel this fucking wash of emotion come out and you talk about it and then you feel so much better so much better and it's fucking hard to have those conversations and to go yep i'm on my ass and I've, this is happening and this is happening and this is happening and i'm thinking of doing this or whatever um those conversations have got to be started and 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 to to be in a safe place you know to 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 know that it's okay to be vulnerable and it's not showing weakness. Showing real strength of character is being able to be fucking weak, I think, and to being vulnerable and like a fighter to go, yep, I fucked up here or someone to go, yep, I'm, I'm weak here and that's okay, but I want to fix that game. I want to mend that. That to me is real fucking strength. 100%. You know? One of my friends that just uh, went through some fucking shit, horrific shit, you know, like not just went through, went through it before and then um, he was... Uh, He's, he came out now and told told me some stuff that happened to him when he was a kid, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, fucked up shit. Yeah. You wouldn't wish it on anyone, you 100%. know. And I was saying to him, "Man, you should probably go speak to someone, you know, because like he fucked up my head just from telling me." Wow, you know. Yeah. And I said to him, "You should go speak to someone." The thing <clears throat> he said to me was, um, "He said, well, what what's that going to do? They're not going to fix it, and they're not going to think, and I can't." Like, I, I can't say to him, you they are. But it's funny you should say that because he did go and speak to, like, a... Professional. A professional. Yep. And then he the feedback he said to me was like, man, it's like the first time he spoke about it, it's exactly what you said, like that. Really? You know? Just... Yeah, and look, because, you know, you carry guilt and you carry oh, shit yeah. over, over stuff like that. Oh, yeah. And then, and then, obviously, now, obviously, it's getting worse for him before it gets better but he understands that it's part of the process. Right, yep. And like a lot of shit where like self-destructive behaviors, Completely. stop blaming himself and blah, blah, blah. So from my end, I think like if you can't speak to someone, it's not, because I think a lot of guys, you know, when you speak to them, they're like, what the fuck's that going to do? What's it going to do? What are you going to solve it for me, Fab? And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to fucking touch your forehead yep. and it's going to be all right. No, but you don't even know how to 
understand the thinking or identify yeah we don't we don't have the fucking tools in our brain to be able to work it out some things you cannot intellectually solve men we like to solve problems one plus one equals two you know and most of the time you can get a result with something but sometimes there's just fucking no way to work it out and you're right as your mate you know you start and sometimes it's floodgates come out and then you feel really vulnerable and then it's like, but it's good to know that once you know, once you have expressed an issue or, or overcome something or admitted something or whatever else, you know, your body sort of goes into shock or you're vulnerable. But then, if if you realise that's part of the process, then that's where the sort of healing and can start, you know. And everything is, you know, you, you can get through this, you know. And there's fucking so many people, whether you're like a psychologist or you're like a kinesiologist or you change your diet or you fucking find martial arts or you find a bloody girlfriend or whatever else. There's there's way through there's ways through it and you're not alone you know you're fucking not alone and at, at those times where you feel there's no way out you know it's easy to think that there's no one else feeling like this I'm the only one and shit can get real quickly but there are so many people going through exactly what you're going through and it's fucking okay it's fucking okay you know there was a guy on our podcast uh, Tim Tim Wharton and he works with uh, he's the guy that he works with violent sex offenders. Wow. I don't know if there's such a thing as a non-violent sex offender. It's yeah. a fucking different thing. But mm-hmm. he he's... Anyways, he might... That's fascinating. No, oh, it's fucking... Fuck. You've got to listen to the podcast. It's cool. Tim Wharton's one. Super smart guy. Awesome. And and uh, when you speak... My mate spoke to... Not him, but spoke to like an equivalent kind of guy like him that does stuff like that. And he was like, it's only happened to me. And, da, da, da. Mm. and then the guy... When he spoke to him, he was like, like he was like reading his mind. He was like, and A, B, C, D, and da, da, da. And they were talking just like how we're talking now. My mate was saying to me, and he goes, it was scary because then he started realizing, nah, like, like there's like case studies done on this. This has happened hundreds, maybe not thousands of thousands, times. Thousands, tens of thousands. Yeah, of this times. has happened over and over and over and over again. And the guy, when he was talking, like, because they were just talking and he was like prompting him and shit. Mm. And he's like, how the fuck do you know Completely. this? Completely. You know what I mean? And, and then he realized as well that like, he 100% wasn't alone. Yep. You know? 100%. That, and I think that's all he got from it in as far as like, and it helped him heaps. It wasn't like he was just alone on it. Awesome. Yeah. It's exactly. There, there's professionals there and it's, it's fucking hard because you think that you can nut it out yourself and you can't. We don't have the ability to, you know, sometimes. And, and, I just cannot stress highly enough that there is fucking help and there is better days ahead, you know. So <clears throat> being an ambassador for AIK is awesome, you know, and All so right. I'm stoked to get involved with those guys. Um, started an Instagram account just about fucking three or four months ago, pretty slow on that. So uh, putting yeah. updates and bits and pieces out on that. Um, and, uh, yeah, getting back to music. So Excellent. music. You're playing anywhere? Uh, we're just organising a tour with a guy called James Van Cooper and we will be doing an East Coast run in September. Dates will be out soon. All right. Awesome. No worries. Thank you very much for coming, man. Really appreciate it. Thank you so Thanks much, guys. Eli, thank you very awesome. much. Awesome. Thanks, Eli.